Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. First hour is general discussion about uh, media, virtual production, whatever you ask us about. Uh, so that's what we'll be talking about in the first hour. Second hour, we're going to talk about uh, Light and Magic. And this is the new documentary from Disney. And... Uh, really cool <laughs> really well done we're not gonna, we'll talk a little bit about the actual show and our breakdown of it we'll also talk about the storytelling and then we'll also talk about the technical ends of it which i think are pretty interesting i mean just just how they put this together is just amazing so we'll be talking about that in the second hour all right let's go ahead and jump into the questions bill what do we got our first one this morning comes in from Todd Perry in Prescott, Arizona. And Todd asks, with another Apple event coming up, does anyone think we'll ever get Final Cut Pro in some form on the iPad? All I'd really like to see is a way to log and rough cut in a light version of Final Cut Pro while on site or on the road. Go ahead, Bill. Well, um, you kind of have that now in a couple of areas. A lot of people use iMovie to do exactly that. Now, it doesn't do all the logging. There are solutions that do that specifically, things like... Um, um, Oh, gosh. Lumberjack. I, Lumberjack, thank you. Lumberjack mm -hmm. Systems from our friends at Intelligent Assistance. Lumberjack will allow you to use iPads or iPhones to watch a performance or an event and log in real time and actually set up key uh, keywords in advance and literally click on them. And then it exports an XML that'll, that you can import into Final Cut and literally have a rough cut done when things are finished. So those are two ways to do it. As to whether they will port the Final Cut Pro software to the iPad, we've been talking about that for a long time, or the iPhone. Um, but I do think they're kind of keeping them separate. There are so many functions built into Final Cut Pro that even if the processor could do it, I'm not sure the interface is the right thing for that much complexity. And I will just point out something like working with keyframes in Final Cut Pro is a little bit difficult because they tend to be very small in the interface. They don't have a big keyframing interface. I can't imagine to trying to work with keyframes on something as small as a phone or an iPad interview interface, even though you have a lot of resolution, it could probably do it. I don't think it would be very comfortable. My two cents. Yeah, iMovie is what a lot of people do to do the rough cuts because it'll export straight out to or be imported directly into Final Cut. Um, I think that uh, if you're looking for Final Cut to to do things, LumaPad or Luma Fusion, Luma Touch, Let's right. Luma oh, Touch. Yeah, <laughs> that's so many, so many Lumas. I know, that. Uh, but Luma Touch. Um, is uh, is a great solution as well. If you're really trying to do an actual edit on an iPad, um, it really is in a lot of ways Final Cut on uh, on the iPad. Go ahead, Sky. I was going to suggest the same thing because they have really advanced and in, they actually come, uh, the, the creators come from the uh, nonlinear editing industry from both Avid and uh, Premiere. And so they bring a lot of that history into the iPad format and they're very well connected with all of the cloud-based uh, solutions as and well. And there's no so. way to export though a Luma, uh, there's no way to export a Luma Touch to Final Cut, right? Is it too EDL? Mm. I would have to look that up, but it goes nicely into both Resolve and and Final Cut. I mean, sorry. It uh, I, if me, it does, if let it goes me look that resolve, up. It'd be, it'd be really interesting to know because uh, that could be your solution because it's really close to it. If, if you're able to export a rough cut out of uh, LumaTouch to Final Cut for further editing. Like um, a traditional could... EDL, I think so. Yeah. Let me, yeah. I, I know there are several users here on the panel that uh, use it fairly regularly and started on it. So they're not encumbered with the old ways of doing things. They've yeah. only ever done it on an iPad. So uh, I checked Chuck and uh, Eric yeah. up in Bellingham. So yeah, so take a look at it. All right, next question. Albi Lopez comes up next from San Antonio, Texas, and Albi says, how can I animate animals' mouths, such as dogs talking to the words? My little one started to watch a show called Pup Academy, produced by the Air Bud Production, and want to do something similar, and he's got a link there. All right, go ahead, Courtney. Well, I haven't looked at the link, but uh, you can take this from anywhere like, uh, you know, Terry Gillum's animation of uh, flat stills or, or South Park's animation uh, using just moving jaws that jump up and down in, in one dimension uh, to Rhythm and Hues or any ILM or those that animate talking animals in the movies, <clears throat> one costing very little. Oh, there. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah, that looks fairly simple if it's done in a still shot. The tricky part comes if, uh, if you're animating moving video. 
If it's a still image that you're working with, it's fairly easy to do the animation. You just uh, load it into Photoshop, you cut out the jaw and move it up and down and <clears throat> paint something that looks like the inside of the mouth uh, for when the jaw is open and, and you synchronize the movement of the jaw to the audio track. If the dog or cat or animal is moving its head, that becomes much more difficult because then you have to create a 3D object for the jaw and move it around and synchronize it frame by frame with the movement of the head of the animal. So it can be very tedious, uh, but it can be done. Uh, and a lot of 3D software that's out there can uh, can generate could generate an object that looks like that. Then you would have to uh, skin it and uh, put a texture on it, take the texture from the actual animal's mouth photo, paste it on that 3D object, and move it around and animate it based on the movement of the head. So. Uh, it can be very complex or fairly simple. But, Go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, yeah, Courtney's exactly right. You know, there's a, there's a high-end way to do it, the ILM way, um, or uh, the average uh, producer uh, way to do it. And there's probably a bunch of plugins. I've seen them before where it'll take a still and then I, and it'll open its mouth and close it to the uh, to the soundtrack. Not very uh, convincing, but a kid might find it very uh, interesting. Um, if I were to do it in After Effects, I would uh, do a combination of mocha and character animation in order to get that movement to follow it. But there's a lot of deformation that's going on. It's not just a hinged jaw that's opening and closing. There's the tongue in there, there's the lips, and some of the facial expressions need to be inc incorporated also. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. I will send you to the simplest process. There's an app for that. It's called My Talking Pet. And so you take a picture of your pet, you put it in there, and you talk into the microphone and the pet talks. Pretty much simple. It's not going to fool anybody into thinking it's ILM. But if you just want it as a simple gag, it's like, I don't know, 99 cents or something like that. And this that. is on the iPhone? Yeah, it's on all of them. It's called My Talking Pet. It's oh, an app, and they have a My Talking Pet Pro as well. Oh, there you go. There you go. That's, we'll have to try it. The um, uh, What I looked at the video and scanning through the video, I think that probably what they did is they remodeled each dog's, uh, at least their, their front part of their face. Um, so there's built in 3D with fur simulations and everything else, and they're really animating it, looking at it. It's, and then what you're doing, as, as was mentioned before, is tr doing a 3D track on the head. So they're going to track that head. They're going to look for features that don't change, corners of the eyes, ends of the nose, so on and so forth. And they're going to track the position down to the pixel. And um, then you just have the 3D, you have that 3D piece that's in the front that's being tracked to the, to the, um, to the face, and then you're just animating it. And then the, the key is that fur has to match perfectly. You're going to have to find a seam that you can composite into. Um, but that one looks like, I mean, what it looks like there is it looks like a 3D animation that is done over it. So it's not a simple uh, solution, um, but the uh, my talking pet. Um, we'll, we'll have to try that and see how close it gets. Go ahead, Bill. I just looked up, and it's they moved to subscription, but you do get one year free. So I guess they want to get you addicted to having your pet talking, so you subscribe and keep going. <laughs> we'll try it. We'll try it. I'll take a picture of my cat and see what happens. There you go. All right, next question. Next one comes to us from Mitchell Hill in Wilmington, Delaware. Perhaps we can review the minimum requirements again to comply with office hours panelist standards. We have been discussing this on After Hours lately. Camera, lights, and audio, for example. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I've been spending more and more time on After Hours, and um, it, uh, it might surprise you that there are a lot of people that are producers or um, ghosting and watching what's going on, but don't necessarily think that they're ready for prime time um, as a panelist. And I've seen some of them, they are. So I think that there's a little bit of communication that might be in order here to tell people, um, you know, what do you need in order to be acceptable? I, I, I noticed that uh, Alexander, who's here with us right now, he's got a perfectly good setup, and I'm glad that he finally decided to uh, to join us on the panel but I thought also maybe it's a good idea to tell people, here's what you need just to get into the ball game, and here's what we're looking for. Yeah, I mean, I think that what we really need to think about is is the, the bare minimum requirement is an Airy LF with an Anshiny lens, um, <laughs> you know, preferably an 18 to 35. Uh, you want that, to, you know, and then, uh, you know, think about a, a, a um, Neumann U87. You know, that's that's a really great way to get, I mean, as, as an entry level, uh, Mike, uh, as you... As you <laughs> Sorry. I hope everybody knows he's kidding. I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> Shouldn't be more anyway. than 130,000, 140,000. Exactly. 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 For the lens. So, so the most important part of, of, of what we do here is the mic. So um, so I would, you know, if you can, I mean, we've had folks come on and we, for a while we did headset mics. So you'll find that most of us have some version of a radio-ish mic. Um, I think that I'm spend, I spent $200 on this mic. This is the one that Courtney got me hooked on. And we've decided it sounded better than my $600 mic. So for me, for my voice, um, for, for what it's there. So, uh, so I think that, um, you know, a good microphone goes a long way. I think there's some folks here we're testing. In fact, when I was on, at the hotel last week, you can look at mine, that was an $85 T-bone mic, uh, which I think sounded fine. Um, and would sound better in this space than it did in that horrible hotel room. Um, and so, uh, the uh still bitter about that anyway um paid a lot of money for that hotel room so that it would have be nice and <laughs> picture i got catfished anyway so um so the uh uh so the i think that an 85 dollar that t-bone mic right now is probably the good under 100 dollar mic that you could get for it and anything above that probably is going to be fine um, and so I think that do having a good mic makes the whole thing more and being able to control it to some degree, because right now I'm a little hot. Um, but being able to do that, I think is, is the, that's the biggest thing that we need you to be able to do. And then after that, I mean, really your webcam is fine. Um, you know, it's, it's not, it, it, you don't need more, more than that. Um, you could get a Brio. You're going to look a lot nicer. That's what Sky is using right now as a Brio. Is that right, Sky? Correct. With the MV7 by Shure, and that is the 4K Brio yeah. that I'm looking into. And With so the, the, the Lazo, and you'll talk yeah. about the background next. Yeah, I mean, but you don't, I mean, however you make your background is your background. We're using Elastolite, or it's now a Manfrotto um, background that is like a 6x7 or 5x6. 6x7 is what I recommend. Um, but you don't have to have any of that. I mean, you can literally have, um, I, again, it's... The, the thing that's the most important is that it that it's easy to listen to you. Most of people are listening to the show. And so we don't want them to be, <clears throat> it, you know, that's the thing we, we mostly want you to work on. But if your camera is still a work in progress, it's fine. Um, you know, obviously, it's nice if you put more into it, but it is um, not definitely not a requirement. Um, you know, if, if someone came in and they were underlit with their with their whatever, you know, with the and they had a great mic, <laughs> that would be fine. Because uh, it's really people are listening to to what you're doing. And then, of course, all of us keep on investing um, in uh, in what we do and make it look a little nicer just because you're hanging out with a bunch of people that have invested stuff into it. It's like when you hang out with a bunch of people that dress a certain way, you start to think, well, maybe I should, should get a sports jacket. So um, so anyway, the uh, but, but I think that overall, if you're thinking about jumping in, I would highly recommend jumping in earlier than later. Of course, we pick at everything. It's just to make us better at what we do. Um, but we'd love to have you on onto the on the panel. Go ahead, Bill. And as Alex was emphasizing the sound of things, um, a, a less stellar microphone, not the Stellar X2, but a less uh, precise microphone will do better if the room itself doesn't sound too bad. So we talk a lot about the fact that if you can find yourself in a circumstance where you have some absorbive walls and or ceiling or something like that, and it can be just a standard popcorn ceiling as opposed to completely flat and carpet on the floor rather than a hardwood floor. And anything you can do, you'll notice over my shoulder that way are curtains. And that's part of my sound treatment in here is just heavy curtains to absorb sound reflection. If the room sounds good, an inexpensive mic also sounds good. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Sky. Well, again, I just wanted to add that the function of the, the gray is, is just a single, and to change the color is just a single light at the base of it. And I realize I am talking into a set of curtains that are covering up my, 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 wind, my bay window that looks out onto the lake. And consequently, the sun is shining in Seattle, so I've get this weird light pattern that's going now. But normally, I just have the the the, the ring light at at the top, which is a bit of a challenge with uh, glasses. Next question. Next question comes to us from Robert Soji in Los Angeles, and he says, "Are there any are any of the panelists familiar with the Siri C sixty C sixty B LED lights? Would these like works well as a key light for interviews?" Go ahead, Courtney. It seems like it could. It's it's kind of, looks like it's kind of modeled. I looked at their website. It is an Indiegogo project, so um, longevity of the company is might be a question. But it looks like the the instrument itself is uh, modeled after uh, still photography lights um, that 
a lot of still photographers are familiar with the or strobe photography. I've been using strobe photography for years. Although it can act like a strobe, but it is a constant light. It uses a Cobb LED <clears throat> for its uh, illumination, and it uh, can be powered off of batteries, so it's portable. Uh, it uses the in-cell, the in-type uh, Sony-type batteries that go clip on the top, a couple of them. Uh, or it can be powered off of a transformer-based uh, switching power supply. Uh, it supposedly has low noise compared to others, so <clears throat> a lot of those still photographer lights are fairly noisy because they're not designed for working with video. So they have fans in them, which make them fairly noisy. But this apparently they've redesigned the uh, heat sink on the cob, uh, on the cob uh, illumination device so that it, they can put a very low volume fan in there and it cools. Uh, keeps it cool without causing too much fan noise. I think it does have a fan in it. And they make it in two versions, uh, a daylight only and a dual color, so you could switch between tungsten and daylight. It also has, um, uh, it could be used for special effects lighting. Uh, they have an app, of course, that goes with it that connects to it over Bluetooth. And it uh, it has specialty type lighting, so you could simulate a fireplace or someone watching a TV or watching a movie or... Uh, the police arriving or something, except I don't think it's as multicolor. It's just uh, white. Uh, so it can and do, do di various different kinds of flicker effects uh, if you need that uh, on your subject. And you can also gang uh, several of the instruments together to control them from the app so they can group together and do a group fade or group fade up or fade down or uh, control different lighting presets uh, from the app. So it looks interesting. I don't know what the price is. I didn't see what the price is. About 250 same. 270 something in that range. So that's fairly reasonably priced. So it looks like it, it could work nicely. It has also has accessories available like a, a giant reflector umbrella that uh, can give you a nice soft look um, to uh, for doing portraiture work. Uh, so it'll do a nice soft light, but that's an extra extra cost and mounts on the front and takes up a lot of space. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I, I, when I saw S-Siri, S-I-R-U-I, it's an unusual spelling of that. Uh, I was immediately th uh, thinking about monopods and tripods because there is a brand. I assume it's the same brand. And if so, they're pretty well established in the marketplace. They have a good reputation as a manufacturer of those kind of aluminum products. Now, this may be their foray into lighting. When you said Indiegogo, I was a little bit surprised because I would have thought they were a big enough operation to have a more uh, robust R&D process if they want to move into lights. But yeah, I'm, I'm and uh, Courtney mentioned the fact that they are, have kind of a photography uh, feeling to them. The Bowens mount came out of photography and is epidemic around the planet. People have been using Bowens mounts. It's a circular mount that all sorts of light modifiers click into. And on professional photography strobes, Bowens mounts are just everywhere. The advantage of that is that there are tons of light modifiers. So if this continuous light has a single source, a chip on board, as opposed to an LED array, that would mean that that whole universe of light modifiers is open to you as a continuous lighting video practitioner as well. And that could be a real good benefit. So I'd, I'd give them a check out and see if the light is good and color rendering is fine. You're going to have a big universe to play in there. Yeah, it, um, you know, there's a lot of companies that make these. Uh, I think that uh, Aperture and Nanlite make them. They're all those are probably about fifty to one hundred percent more expensive than the ones that you're pointing out. I would definitely get bicolor. You really want the flexibility these days. A lot of us don't get the, the single colored version because you want to make sure that you can move to what what makes the most sense uh, for your your scene. You will want to budget for su using that Bowens mount for a large diffusion. You know, if you're going to be doing interviews with it. You're going to want something that's, you know, two by two or three by three, um, you know, that's going to be a so big soft light. Uh, we'll talk about that in, in the second hour. So those are the only things, other things I would probably add to that. Next question. Stefan Fischer comes to us from Wurzburg, Germany this morning, and he says, My Mixpre 6.2 refuses to play back a recorded speech to me via the built-in headphone jack. Yes, the headphone is plugged in as well. Playing the exported files on my computer works fine. Any ideas? Go ahead, Mitchell. I don't have a mix pre, but I, I can try to help work through this. Uh, I guess my first question would be, is it a file that was recorded on the mix pre in the first place? That would be very unusual that a file that you were able to record isn't playing back. This may be a routing issue within the uh, the mix pre. 
And then the other thing, usually what happens with files that become incompatible is that the sample rate may be beyond the capability of the device you're playing it on. You don't know. And here's the thing. Um, a lot of the, uh, like, uh, it may end as a dot .wav file, but that's a wrapper in many cases. Mm -hmm. So you may have a different flavor inside there you're dealing with. Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, yeah, I, I think probably the reason is not if, it, if that file was originated somewhere else or if you've taken it out of the mix pre, done some editing on it in some other software and saved it back it, as a WAV file. But that other software has modified the WAV, WAV file right. chunks that are in that WAV file. Then the mix pre may choke on it and not play it back. But if it was recorded in the mix pre, it should play it back. Um, it sounds like it's playing back. It's just that he can't hear it, and so that that I you know it, it's like it, it, he said he just can't hear it through the headphones. And so my guess is is that your headset is not set to listen to the mix or to the or to the specific tracks it was recorded to. So if you're seeing if you're seeing it bounce and you're seeing it play back and it you can't hear it in the headphones, then most likely your headphone preset is is not set to listen to the tracks that are there. So you you're listening to tracks one and two as a right left and it's on track three or it's or it's on track you know there's a bunch of different ways that that could happen but i would look at your head so headphone settings and what uh let me see um i was looking to see what uh yeah mickey says make sure your headphone preset is set to play back the left right mix um so i think that it has to do with your headphones setting your preset and to go through that and see if it doesn't show up if it's playing back if you're seeing the meters bouncing and it's actually playing the file and it sounds like you recorded it on the mix pre, so it should just play it back. But if you're not you're just not hearing it on the headphones, it's a headphone preset issue, and you seem to go through. There's a lot of options. You can listen to all the tracks. You can listen to the mix. You can listen to left, right. You can listen to a single track. So those are all things that you could have um, misselected there somewhere. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from Alex Knight in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I play back Monday's episode to check how I looked on YouTube and noticed my video did not look as smooth as it should. I was coming in at 60 frames per second. I'm guessing the downsampling to 30 frames per, se per second is the issue with office hours? Uh, yeah, Zoom is 30 frames a second. <laughs> so so it, it's not even office hours uh, sampling it down. It's, it is... Uh, Zoom is going to give you up to 30 frames a second. It's not going to give you 60 currently. So, so um, yeah, if you're if you're sending 60 frames a second, the, the, you'll notice that there's probably your shutter speed won't be right because it's throwing every other frame out um, as it goes through. So you may look a little more, more little more framey if you're moving back and forth. So you can do two one of two things. Well, obviously, you can go down to 30 frames a second or you can open up your shutter speed to three, 360 degrees um, and it will... Um, now be a little dreamy for 60 frames a second, but it'll be perfect for 30 frames a second. And we do that a lot. We did that a lot because we were streaming at, in the old days, we would stream at 720p 30, but there is no real format at 720p 30. So we would be doing it, we'd have 720p 60, and but we'd be throwing every other frame away. So we turned our, our, uh, our shutter up to 360 degrees. So that would be the proper shutter for the 30 frames a second. So the, um, So that's probably what you're looking at uh, there, I do, you know, we, we do want to experiment with 60 frames someday in the future, mostly because a lot of the testing that we're showing, it seems like at first, it seems like it's a waste of frames. We're just sitting here talking. But one of the things that we've started to see is that higher frame rates make things feel more real, like they feel more like they're present, you know, and lower frame rates tend to make it feel more cinematic, but also more detached. And so, um, you know, so we're noticing that, uh, 60 frames a second and i have to admit this is a long way coming around for me because i was always like 60 frames a second is a waste of time um and uh i'm not sure if i believe that anymore go ahead alex yeah so my rolling video switcher will not do anything other than 50 or 59.94 so that's why i've set my camera to 60 but if i have to do the I think you said 360 degree shutter rule so if i'm at 59.94 what would the Just set it to 60. 60 instead frames 60. Of, instead okay. of 120. You know, if you're at 60, it'll be at, uh, what, 180 degree shutter means it's half as the shutter is, you know, quote unquote, ha open half the time that the frame is. And that's what we're typically used to. Um, in the old days, sometimes it, to be make, make, it, make them more rugged, they were set at 90 degrees. That was, so all your World War II footage looks a little bit more um, framey because of, and, and actually Saving Private Ryan, I think was almost all, I think it was all shot in 90 frame um, to give it the, you know, the war film kind of look. Um, but, uh, but if you, 
at the higher frame rates also the 360 degree becomes less blurry because obviously it's just a lot of less frames in fact when we do uh, 120 frames per second we've taken ourselves to using 360 a lot it looks it actually looks less framey for some reason i'm not sure exactly why but it the, i haven't figured out the science behind it but it looks better at a 360 degree shutter than it does it so anyway that's that's something to look at there um yeah so but if you set it to 60 frames it should look you should have proper motion blur at, at 30. Uh, next question Next one comes from Santa Bart Gaffney in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. No question, just wanted to shout out to the gang working after hours for their assistance with my ATEM Stream Deck issues. Go ahead, uh, Mitchell. Uh, Santa is a, uh, a new addition to After Hours, and uh, he came to us with a question and a problem. Uh, his companion software was not uh, communicating with his Stream Deck. And uh, with the, he had an excellent panelist there, Mickey and uh, Brandon and Eric and myself. Uh, we were able to walk him through. He had a problem with a uh, mismatch on the IP address uh, with the companion talking to his computer. Um, he was running Windows. So we were able to sort that out. But one of the interesting things about Santa Bart's setup is that he has a green screen that he bought a trampoline from his neighbor and stretch this green screen out behind him, uh, which is basically a trampoline and it's curved uh, in its uh, presentation. And it is the most interesting 16 by nine uh, green screen with all the stuff built into it, with all the holdouts and uh, the eyelets and springs and things to keep it taut. And so he's got himself a great Santa background going on there. And now he has his stream decks working. That's awesome. And, and, and just for all of you listening, a lot of times uh, that after hours is open 21 hours, uh, we close it right as we do pre-show for this show, and then we open it back up again. And uh, there's lots of people in there. Sometimes you'll go in, all the cameras will be off and people will just be there, but they're, they're sitting, a lot of them are just sitting there listening. And if you come in and say, I've got a problem, suddenly see a couple of windows start turning on and, and people start figuring stuff out online. And so it's a, it's a really interesting, uh, it's, it's really useful and very entertaining a lot of the time. Uh, next question. Alex Knight in Vancouver, British Columbia up next. Is there interest in moving office hours from 30 to 60 frames per second in the future? Go ahead, Courtney. Well, there might be interest in it. Um, I think it has to do with the Zoom codec, whether or not it would be wise or not to do that, because the Zoom codec uh, kind of does a trade-off of frame rate versus resolution. So uh, usually if you get a higher resolution, you sacrifice frame rate. So if you give a higher frame rate, you may have to sacrifice resolution. So um, I don't know if it would be wise uh, and if the system could handle it. I mean, Zoom seems to be uh, working at its, you know, at the top end all the time to gather, especially if you have a large number of panelists here in the gallery that it's having to process those incoming frames in and put them in, uh, scale them down and put them into a, a grid. Um, it's doing a lot of work and causing your CPU to do a lot of work and that's going to double all of that work by going to 60. So uh, the Zoom codec will react and you'll have to see how the Zoom codec reacts and whether it gives you a lower resolution to achieve a higher frame rate or if it just takes your 60 frames and dumbs it down to 30, you know, <laughs> or I, I'm, 15 I'm, or 12. I'm a big fan if, if Zoom can get the back end to support it. 4K, 120 frames per second, HDR, uh, 5.1 sound, maybe even Atmos. You know, I think I think melt uh, my fiber optic cable coming. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I'm I'm there. Like like I'm so if you're at, if there's if, if you're asking if there's interest, I'm interested all the way up to that. I think after that it gets a little absurd. I think 8K 240 frames a second. It's absurd, absurd. But but up, up to 4K 120, I'm 100% in. So anything that Zoom does to update this, we will take advantage of it. Well, we all um, have to buy phantom cameras. I'm really <laughs> <laughs> no, just the this iPhone is an now. Expensive these days, conversation. Just an iPhone. Yeah, all you need is an iPhone at this point. All right, next question. Next question comes from us and Mitchell here, Hill here on the panel from Wilmington, Delaware. Making the Cut at Pixar, all in quotes, is a new book that explains how Pixar completely reshaped the role of the editor in animation with plenty of examples. What do you think? And he's got a link there. Go it's Sky. Yeah, I've been looking at this book since we you posted it. Thank you for posting it early. And I'm very fascinated with it because I, if there's a director's uh, function feature on any of these movies, I will listen to the director talk about how they did things. And so this says it has 90 minutes of never before seen works, but it also takes us through the storyboard process to the virtual cameras to the final animation. And that's why 
originally when Toy Story came out or one of the original Pixar films, it thought it was just the story. From my st- understanding, Toy Story 2 was created as a straight to VHS. And then I think at the time, Steve Jobs says, no, let's go back and let's do it right. And that's why that that chain continued on. And then they continued to expand it to other other characters. But I'm very interested in this because, uh, again, they do outtakes, but there's no such thing as an outtake on an animation. Every cell is intentional. And so you, you'll learn these little uh, decisions of, of creative choices that they've made. I, I'm very interested in this book. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, it was cool to see what you might consider to be best practices. And uh, best practices is a, a missing component in a lot of things that uh, we all do. But lots of examples, lots of things that you can see. And, I, I you know, I don't want to do uh, Pixar animation, but I was fascinated with the story, at least as I started to get into it. There you go, Sky. Well, and... Again, in listening to the director's cut, Wall E was the very first when they put a live human into a uh, their animated series, and they didn't know how to use a real camera because they did everything on uh, animation. So that was um, mm. go ahead, I bet, Alex. I bet you they had to use a, a really good camera in Northern California. Maybe. Uh, yeah. So Anybody we know? You probably need a four 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 F nine fifty. It's my guess with a. Fujin on Zoom lens. Yeah. I bet you. I bet, bet you a lot of money that that's what they'd have to do. Anyway. <laughs> Behind the scenes. Maybe that's in the Coincidentally, book. I, I, own, I owned, owned a 950. <laughs> so anyway, so um, uh, uh, in Northern California. Um, so just, just a coincidence. T- tidbits. These little things yeah. you find out. That yeah, would be so, a Sony camera, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so um, the... Uh, uh, I think it's really interesting. Uh, you know, one of the things that really that we started doing in uh, at Lucasfilm, and I think probably it, it's a similar. I haven't read this book yet. I, I did order it because Mitchell suggested it, so I, I read it on my Kindle now. I just haven't opened it. I did it this morning, but uh, I, I, uh, um, I what was interesting is really coming across where you're thinking through the story. You take the story. You have storyboards. You cut the storyboard. So a lot of times in, at at Lucasfilm and Previs, we would storyboards would all get cut in. Then we do animated storyboards for all of that. And you're doing all of this editing when it's not expensive. <laughs> so you're figuring out all these things. And Ben Burt was adding sound effects and we're cutting things in and we're figuring out what works and what doesn't work before we get on set when there's millions of dollars at stake and there's a, you know, a big shoot and we're doing all these other bits and pieces. And it, uh, I don't know if it's true, but, you know, Rick McCallum said, you know, saved the movie over $50 million to have all that previs done before we got out there to shoot. So, and so for, and because that was my first movie, <laughs> I, mean, I, know, I know that sounds crazy, but my first movie was a little space movie. And so I didn't have any other experience. So every time I'd go to someone after that and they'd be like, well, we have a shot list. I'm like, okay, where's the storyboards? Where are the animatics? <laughs> like, where, what are we supposed to be doing here? <laughs> and so, uh, so I was just kind of used to that's the pi- pipeline that you have. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is take on doing little shorts, um, you know, inside of office hours uh, at some point in the future. And my idea really is, is that we do work through those storyboards and we do do previs and we do do, th- do those. And then we use camera to cloud so that while we're shooting where those clips are going up to frame, people are pulling them down and putting them into the edit with all the animatics and storyboards and everything else, seeing how they cut through. And while we're still on set, we're able to say, hey, it'd be really good if I had a close up of the hands doing something, you know, because that what's really expensive is going back and rebuilding that set and doing that setup again. It's much less expensive to um, my thought is, is really thinking about a shooting process where you're shooting six or eight hours a day. And that's what you plan to do. And then you have pickups, you know, at the end before you destroy a setup, you have pickups and like and there's a list. But the idea is the editor or editors would be looking at it in the edit and saying, it'd be really good if I just had one more, cause you never get that. You know, like if I just had one more over the shoulder, or if I had this camera moving around and we can be, you know, be creative as a group. Um, and I think that we now have the technologies to do that, that we didn't have before. And that, you know, and their edit could be sh- saved back and being shown to the director in real time. And, you know, there's a lot of like, but, but rethinking that, and that, that process. And while some of it may slow things down, it could speed up a lot of things as well as you, as you start to kind of work through it. Um, next question. 
Next one comes to us from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. He says, for a festival, thinking outside the box, has anyone tried mounting a pan tilt zoom camera to a tethered blimp? With Ethernet cable for power over Ethernet, the weight should be okay. And he's got a link there for an airship package. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, the only problem I see is wind. Uh, with a tethered blimp, uh, wind comes up, it's going to move it from where you think it is. It's going to put a lot of strain on that Ethernet cable uh, or your steel tether that you have it tethered with. The other, I came up with an interesting idea, and as long as the PTZ is not really a PTZ but a gimbal-mounted uh, camera that can take any of the rock and roll out of the blimp that's moving in the wind and stabilize that image a little better than a regular PTZ would. So if you use, uh, like the new... Uh, 360 Insta Insta 360 link uh, might work well, or any of the drone type cameras. And so this started me thinking on the idea: Well, what if you put a blimp up there with the Ethernet cable and power to it, and you put little docking stations up there for drones? And so you could have like Mavic, <laughs> the mothership, the Mavic mothership that would find themselves uh, that would you know go out and shoot some remote shots and then come back and dock into the blimp. And while they're charging, they could their cameras could still work and feed uh, signals down the Ethernet while they're charging up. And then they could go out on a little mission and then come find their way back to the charging port and the blimp and where one could stay and and use a, a permanent camera location. The other one could rove the crowd. You know. That would be an interesting concept, and I'm sure it could be done since those uh, return to home, you know, all, all the uh, uh, DJI drones have a return to home button on it, which guides them back to a specific location. And with their uh, collision avoidance cameras, they could guide themselves into a dock uh, to hook up to power. Go ahead, Bill. Courtney, that sounds utterly awesome. I was thinking, you know, for me, it was, uh, I came out of tall stands and then graduated to cranes and at some point we couldn't get much higher unless we got a, a helicopter with a tyler mount which was super expensive so drones really replaced all those mid up shots i mean you didn't have to get a plane or a helicopter but you could go from taller than most of the stands and cranes worked up to a, as tall as you wanted to get something like a landscape golf course or something like that. Uh, so that changed everything. And it, it kind of changed the nature of the business a little bit. But I do love the idea of the airship. The one thing that would allow is persistence. And you're talking about that with the idea of having drones come back and dock and recharge the batteries. Because the one problem with drones is that they have a limited flight time. And often that doesn't match the shot you want to get. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen somebody shooting with a drone and they're going, yeah, hang on. I know you have this idea and, and everything's kind of right, but we got to bring them back and change the batteries. And so that would take care of some of that. It's a cool idea. Yeah, it's, it's actually a pretty common idea in some other areas. So maybe not for festivals, but Border Patrol um, and in uh, more challenging locations, uh, these uh, blimps are actually used um, for, a, I think there's the TAR system and TARS system and the uh, J lens system are both both things that are um, being used to, 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 and these go up, I mean, they can go up at a variety of, I think that they're in the 150 to 200 foot range um, is where they get put up and it's just really expensive to put them up at really high. Like if trying to build something like that is really hard, but being able to move it around and then put it up. Now it's being tethered from multiple locations. So it's anywhere from four to six tethers are, are on it to keep it from moving anywhere or moving very much. Um, and it will, um, but, and they don't, again, they don't put them up that high. And of course, high wind becomes a problem, but, um, but they do allow you to have a flexible um, airborne, airborne platform for, um, for reconnaissance. And so that technology is already, you know, being used relatively often. Um, and so that's something to think about. Go ahead, Ken. So uh, over in chat, uh, they're explaining that uh, Courtney's inventing a thing called Skynet, which is a possibility. And, <laughs> and al although um, his comments might be a little far-fetched, I think the two most important things I heard during his, his uh, explanation were the words, what if? That's yeah, exactly. critical in this kind of an organization. Way to go, guy. Yeah, but yeah, you know, long long term surveillance is something that you know the, these these uh, dirigibles are really good at because they can stay up for a very long period of time. Also, winged systems that are doing big circles can stay up for days, you know, sometimes longer. Um, and so the the drones are just really short because they have to turn those motors 
so fast <laughs> for so for so they last 20, 30 minutes, maybe an hour, uh, depending on the batteries, battery pikes, uh, battery packs. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's the challenge. And the problem you have with, with standard drones is that the more battery you put on it, the heavier it is, which means it has to work harder. So there's a, your return just keeps going down <laughs> until, until we can get solar to be powerful enough on the drones. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Todd Perry in Prescott, Arizona. He says, is there any benefit in activating a 1080p Zoom meeting for clients that may have 720 or lower webcams? The higher bitrate stream, perhaps? Uh, the big advantage is for you, if you have 1080, <laughs> so you'll look way better. So, um, so if you, you know, like if you're, it means that any images that you show into the system. So if you have a system that has 1080, there's a huge advantage. If nobody has a system that's 1080, eh, maybe not, but it doesn't, you might as well ask for it. I mean, cause someone might, um, remember that if they get a Brio or they get any kind of reasonably good webcam and they have the bandwidth, they're going to be able to do it. But if they're all, if, if absolutely nobody has 720, then probably not. If one person does, it's worth doing, uh, or at least making the request. I don't think 1080 costs more. Um, it just is arduous to request it. Um, so yeah, next question. Next question comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. My mother was in a nursing facility and I purchased three movies, A Hard Day's Night, Help, and Sweet Summer Sun by the Rolling Stones. The last movie we watched together was A Hard Day's Night. Can Apple refund the other two? <laughs> Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, so the last time I read Apple's terms of service, I believe they don't issue refunds officially. But in my experience, there have been numerous times where I have been able to get a refund on a rental or an app purchase if you just reach out. So I would say it doesn't hurt to ask. Oftentimes they are willing to do it for you. Good, Bill. And I don't think you get the context here a little bit. I can see why somebody of not the generation that grew up in the 60s and the, where the Beatles were truly a cultural phenomenon, maybe the first monster cultural phenomenon after Elvis Presley and took it from um, a kind of a packaged Hollywood thing into a slightly cheeky thing. But the the... The Hard Day's Night was not a thing designed to be a great movie. I, I honestly believe that. It was designed to feed an almost unbelievable interest in these four young men for Liverpool that just went insane. The world wanted to see them, and they could have literally sat and read the phone book and would have attracted <clears throat> millions of viewers. It was just a different thing. Richard Lester's movie is, is disjointed and weird, but boy, did it serve the audience at the time. Next question. Moving on, Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. What was your best practice size for YouTube thumbnails and banners? 2560 by 1440 seems like the new norm. I guess <laughs> that's the new norm. Uh, most of us have been building stuff. And I'll, I'll do some research on that and find out. But I think that uh, most of us have been building 1920 by 1080 for a long time. Um, you know, so having a higher res one, if it, if it, if there's a 3840 by 2160, I would probably lean into higher resolution. It's always easier to build it, build it ahead of time at, at a high resolution. Um, I think that I don't know if it will accept that size. And so I, you know, 2560 by, I mean, I'm guessing that that is 16 by, I, I don't actually know what that ratio is, um, and whether that's a, a 16 by nine off the top of my head, I think it, it might be close. And so. Um, the largest 16 by 9 you can put in there is probably the best practice because then you never have to go back and do it again. It's usually easier. It's really a pain to have to up-res things later, but it's really generally pretty easy to build them at the higher res. Um, but we'll do some more research and find out what is the highest res that you can do on YouTube. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Santa Bart Gal uh, Gaffney in, uh, in Okanomowak. Uh, green or blue chroma key, which one keys better? Go ahead, Mitchell. Well, the famous, it depends. Um, there's more information in the green channel in your camera. So green generally um, is the color to use, and it's less likely uh, to show up on your skin. But here's where it depends. Uh, you're Santa Claus, and everything is red and green. The holly's going to be green. Uh, maybe some of the elves have green uh, uh, hats on, things like that. So in your case, in a Santa case, I think blue would be the color to go for and go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, blue would less likely show up on the red suit, uh, for sure. Well, it comes from the, the higher resolution comes from the buyer pattern CMOS sensor, as you can see here. There's twice the number of green uh, sensors as there are blue or red. 
So it gives you a higher resolution uh, image to get cleaner edges on your chroma key uh, and finer detail if you're using green because most of the sensors in today's modern cameras use that, uh, uh, they use a single sensor, use that RGB layout uh, with the green, the Bayer layout. And so as a result, uh, it usually gives you cleaner chroma keys. Dealing with spill can become more problematic though. Yeah, I would almost always use green unless I had something green that was almost the same color as my green screen. Like literally with a good, a well-lit green screen, you can key something that's green over top of the green as long as it's not, you can't do that if you have a poorly lit green screen, but if you have a very flat green screen, you even dark greens and lighter greens and everything else are keyable and they're still going to look better than um, using blue. But the problem with blue is it's, it's actually that got it, it just collects all the uh, noise and gunk <laughs> that happens in your video signal. Um, and so it is on a video on a bear pattern as as Courtney put out um, the, in the way that it, the light filters, the blue is very challenging compared to the green to do the keys. We did a lot of research on this with CCDs with three CCDs. It was not as um, problematic. But with uh, CMOS, it's, it, blue is very problematic. And so I would highly recommend sticking with it. I've even done things where we make things blue. And this will sound crazy. We make things blue. We key them over green screen. And then we change their color back to green. <laughs> so so it's, and it's, it was easier to do that than key, especially if it's something that's a, a random object that was going to come in and go back out again. It's not a tree or something. But even like a pine tree that's dark green, I would still put green screen behind it before I did blue. Uh, it's just a, it just doesn't have any data. Uh, next question. Uh, the next question comes from our Eduardo Augustine in Panama, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm sorry, Panama. I got loaned a Zijun Weebill Lab gimbal, but it seems the quick release place doesn't stay put. I need to replace the gimbal. I found online a similar situation posted in place, Facebook, and he's got a link there. Yeah, I don't, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like a little, so the issue is, is that that little piece is there. I mean, this is where... Um, you know, sometimes you are going to end up needing a printer, a 3D printer. <laughs> you find that, that, that notching something or making it, making an adjustment to it. I don't have an, an exact solution here uh, for that, but, but it, you know, oftentimes a, th a 3D printer will make a big difference um, or uh, you, super glue. <laughs> so, so while putting, basically you're putting another something on top of it, gluing it down with either super glue or a two part epoxy. And then it's now part of it. And then you, then you have, you, you, but you've created a new mount that sits on top of that. And that might be some kind of quick release plate. Um, but that we, you know, or welding it or, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it where it's, you're going to put it on, put something else on top of it permanently. Now that really depends on your gimbal and whether that gimbal is going to have some weight issues if, if things um, get shifted around. And so what, what you can and can't do, but I think that, a small machining process or, or 3D print process may be the right solution. Go ahead, Courtney. I'm not sure exactly what his problem is because I don't have Facebook. Uh, that's my problem. But uh, uh, it sounds like perhaps he says the quick release plate doesn't stay put. And, you know, sometimes you'll run into this if you have a quick release plate that bolts to the bottom of your camera with a single quarter 20 screw, that means it can swivel and come unscrewed from the camera. And the best solution to that is to coat the top of that plate. If it does, if it's not coated with some type of silicone rubber, put some silicone rubber glue, some uh, a thin, thin, a thin sheet of neoprene or silicone to the top of that plate uh, securely to the quick release plate. And then that contacts the camera and then when you screw it in that silicone will grip the bottom of the camera and will prevent it from turning and coming loose if that's what your problem is uh, and we have probably have enough room, room for one or two more questions before we get to the second hour so if you've got any burning questions that you want to ask we probably have that room or we'll just switch over to the second hour early uh, next question and before I do that, a note, uh, Douglas Carmichael, I took your question at face value and I've been informed through the back end that, that you, there was a circumstance and anyway, hearts of many of us are with you today. So that's enough of that. Let's move on to Alex Knight, Vancouver, British Columbia. Any recommendations on an Arca Swiss compatible mount for a quarter 20 that provides some freedom of movement to slide my camera back and forth? Can you explain that a little bit, Alex? Yeah, so I have my 
Lumix camera, it's actually mounted on a K&M mic boom. And right now I want to have the capability to have it on some kind of slider where I can manually adjust it. I, I realize I can zoom in, but to be able to just move it forward if I need to, so I can just- And how much it. distance do you need? Well- Move forward, I mean, back? Not that much. I would say, you know, no more than about six to 12 inches, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely, again, there's lots of sliders. So if you do camera slider, you may find something. Usually they're designed to be on something a little larger. Another thing to look at for 6 to 12 inches where you want fine control over that, another thing to look at are, are macro mounts. So these are for macro photography where you move them in and out very slowly. You have a little dial and you can roll them in and roll them out. And this is so that you can set stacked, you can do stacking. So what stacking does is that you're, you're basically taking a picture uh, when you're doing macro, the problem you have is you have a very, very short depth of field. And so what you do is you take the photo at, at a bunch of different, th these macro let you a have a very fine control over it. It also potentially lets you um, not the stacking is just changing the focus point back and forth, not the camera itself. But what they, what the macro does is because you're dealing with something so small, if you move the camera back and forth, it appears, it disappears and appears, disappears. So a lot of times they're there. I might even have one. I don't know if I have one in, um, not within, I have, I use it for something different, which is before Instagram let us do RTMP, we had to shoot a picture of an image of a, of a screen <laughs> so that we could not break the TOS, but have our phone, uh, actually capture the screen for Instagram. And so we use these macros to basically fine tune the whole position of the, of the, uh, camera. And there's a lot of companies that make these, but macro mounts might be something you could look at to, to, uh, make the fine adjustment. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I was just kind of uh, brainstorming something. Maybe you might look into something like a teleprompter mount that has 15-inch uh, rods, and instead of mounting uh, and mount it the reverse, instead of mounting the teleprompter right. in the end, mount the camera on the end, mount the back plate to the head so that right. you, you can slide the camera forward. Now it's going to be out of balance, uh, so you might have to counterbalance it with something. But you could use something like that with uh, either a mat box that's designed to move on rods for long lenses. You could do something like that from um, any of the manufacturers that make, uh, uh, you know, uh, gear for attaching cameras to heads and mat boxes. Uh, so you might try that. As long as you don't need to move it on air, you know, you slide it forward and lock it down and slide it back and lock it down. Uh, that might work for you. Good, Mitchell. From the event chat, Mickey mentions uh, a magic arm. Possibly, yeah. Uh, go ahead, uh, Bill. All those would do it. Also, Arca Swiss is huge in the still photography business, and they have so many sliding mounts and adjustable mounts, including precision geared mounts um, that work in this mode. So I would look at some of the bigger houses, Marker Tech, b and those kind of places. Just um, do a search on Arca Switch. Swiss, excuse me. And I think you're going to get a lot of possibilities. It'll become like the tinker toys of being able to try to customize a rig that gets you exactly what you're looking for. Go ahead, Mitchell. I just wanted to point out Arca Swiss uh, is made to exacting specifications. So you must be careful if you're buying a knockoff. It will not work with, uh, with a well machined, properly de designed unit. Next question. Eduardo Augustine in Panama is right back again with at Alex. Is that a Stellar X2 or an X3? And why is this better than your previous microphone? Uh, so it's a, I don't know if it's better. It just sounds better for this show and live and so on and so forth. But there is a little bit, if you look at the curve on it, it, it is, it goes like this. And then in the three to three to five range, it has this little hump to it and it makes it more present. It may not work for everything that's there, but it is, um, but it definitely for the show and for a live experience, it, it is, I think it sounds clearer and a little less boomy than, than the, and it may have been where I was using the other mic as well. Um, and the distance and everything else. And so, so it's, you know, I need to move this one away a little bit too. So, um, yeah, so I think that, that it is a, uh, it, it, it's just a, how I use it and where it is. And in this position, it sounds better with my voice. So it's not, you know, it's an X2, not an X3. Um, the, I have to admit, if I had seen the X3 before I had, I had, uh, I probably would have bought it. I'm not probably not going to buy it now. Um, but, uh, or not soon. I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to recover from all the mics that I, I, I'm like competing with Paul Wallace now. I've got like a whole lot, a whole <laughs> desk full of Dangerous. mics. I thought I was going to send them back, but the, most of them have passed their time now. So I just have them. <laughs> Lots of mics. Go ahead, Courtney. 
Uh, yeah, at, at the distance you're working from that X2, I would move it either a little further away or maybe just uh, do a little low frequency roll off. That's one of the things the X3 has that mm -hmm. the X2 doesn't have. It has a low frequency roll off and it has a uh, 10 dB pad. Um, right. So, uh, other than that, I think they're very similar capsules and they're very similar sound. Uh, yeah. But I like the sound of this. You, at the distance you're at, I'd roll off just a little bit of the low end because you're a little bit tubby. Go ahead, uh, Sky. Well, I'd be curious to hear this microphone. Did you take this to the hotel last week? I did. I, I, I did take it to the hotel and I chose not to um, use it there because it, it actually is pretty sensitive and it, you could hear the room. You know, that was the big issue is that you could hear the room there. And uh, so I chose not to use it for that um, that area. That's why I use the T-Bone, which is a dynamic mic with a lot more off-axis rejection. Go ahead, Bill. Also, I was going to say, you know, your voice does change over the course of your career. If you're just starting out and you buy one of these microphones expecting to get a sound similar to an Alex or a Courtney or some, those of us who have been in the voiceover kind of industry for a while, your voice really does change over time. And the more you do, the stronger it gets across all the frequency ranges. I'm reminded of the actor Tom Selleck. The first time I saw him in anything, he had a pretty high squeaky voice. And over the course of years, he literally trained his voice down yeah. uh, like two or three octaves to be able to get some low end in there. Mm -hmm. And the more you do this, the more open up it becomes. And then a microphone that maybe was not particularly big and present because you didn't have much of that in your voice suddenly reveals that. So it's a combination of performance and microphone always. The mic doesn't make you sound mm -hmm. something. It captures what you sound like. Yep. Next question. Douglas Carmichael up next. I remember reading about a SpaceX rocket launch where one of the camera people talked about overloading their camera sensor with the intense light. How do you learn about adjusting camera settings and how would you compensate for said overload? Um, yeah, I think that they're just talking about overexposing it past what it can actually handle. Go ahead, Courtney. Well, the way to handle that is uh, like a pad in an audio uh, in an audio chain. A neutral density filter is your friend there in the video chain, which is a filter that knocks down the light but doesn't change the color of it. Uh, one, two, or three stops. So you put a neutral density filter on, and then you have to compensate with your iris for the loss of uh, brightness for the rest of your shot after the rocket has exited the frame. Uh, so a neutral density filter will solve the problem of the light exceeding the sensor values. Uh, usually most, uh, it's not that much of a problem, they'll just clip to white. But if you want to stay within the broadcast range, you have to prevent that from happening. And if your uh, signal processing chain can't handle that uh, without it looking ugly or going to gray or looking solarized, which sometimes happens if the, the voltage goes too high, it comes, starts to go in the other direction. Uh, a neutral density filter is your friend there. Yeah, and the hard part is, is that it's finding the dynamic range. You may start, especially with a rocket, you may start with everything dark and then things get really bright and the neutral density is only going to go one direction. So uh, in some cases, we have adjustable neutral densities where we're flipping basically filters in front of the camera where they're, you know, they'll, they'll have it. And you'll see that where you can hit a button, you'll see it click, click, click. And um, so we may change it during the show. You cut away from it, you go to a darker ND and come back out again. So motorized um, systems like that sometimes can can make a difference. Also, you have variable ND, and so sometimes you have a matte box, and you'll have a you'll have a, a piece of glass that is dark on the top and clear on the bottom, and with a gradient going on it. That that was one of the ways you pull the sky back in. So the sky is now being less exposed, but the things in the foreground are are still at the full exposure. So there's a couple of different ways of managing that. Next question. Eduardo Augustine of Panama. Alex, talking about RTMP on Instagram, are we still using the methods that break Meta's terms of service? I notice Guy isn't here, but YOLO Live might be the pricey solution. Is that worth it? You know, I haven't had to do Instagram since they made some of the changes. I believe that Instagram now allows RTMP, so, um, but I haven't, um, haven't dug into that yet. And you know, the reports that I had from YOLO Live were not super positive, but I haven't had time to test the newest versions. So it's one of those things that we, we need to throw into the lab. Next question. Next one comes to us from Stefan Fischer in Würzburg, Germany. When talking about 3D printers, what's the actual recommendation for a good starting machine? I'll go ahead, Courtney. 
I always recommend the Creality Ender 3. It is priced under $200. You can sometimes get it for about $160. Looks something like this. Some assembly is required. Uh, the newer ones, the S1, is a less assembly. The whole vertical gantry is all pre-assembled for you. So uh, with the Ender 3, yeah, you got to put some screws and some holes and, and uh, mount the vertical parts and the horizontal parts. So if they give you all the tools to do it, and it only takes about 45 minutes or so to assemble. And it lets you, uh, by assembling it yourself, you learn a bit about the mechanical operation of the printer, where things uh, go back and forth and where limit switches are and what could be the problem there. Uh, and for, you know, under $200, you can be, the output of that printer is, you know, can hold up against the Prusas or some of the much more expensive printers. Uh, so for the price... That's a good choice. The, and they make about six different versions of the Ender 3, and they go up from $160 all the way up to about four or $500. Yeah, I have a, uh, the one that I use is a, kid, a Quiddy, Q-I-D-I. I have this thing about wanting to be in a case. I, the open-ended versions of these that are less expensive make me a little crazy. I don't know why. It's just my, I don't know, some OCD thing that I want the printer to be in a box. So um, the Kitty, the, the Quiddy Tech uh, XL, I think I used, it's like $700. So it's a bit more expensive than what Courtney has. Um, does 10 or almost 11 inches by 8 inch by 8 inch. So it's a pretty large volume and which I've used up completely <laughs> and then some. So um, so I, I wanted to have a slightly larger volume. Uh, I don't know what the, what's the Ender uh, volume, um, Courtney? The Ender 3 is uh, about 8 by 8 by 8, you know, 8 right. inch cubed. Um, mm -hmm. They do make a max that can go up to, I don't know, uh, 12 inches or oh, 13 great. inches cubed. So that's yeah. much bigger. Yeah, and so um, so think about that. But as a starting one, the Ender sounds great. I, I was super happy. My Quiddy took about um, 45 minutes to have, I, from, the, from the time I pulled it out of the box to the time it was printing was about 45 minutes. So um, it, was, it was pretty successful. Um, next question. Stefan Fischer, Würzburg, Germany. What can one do to get a better mic voice if this isn't your profession? Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. You can try Costco or you can Costco. practice. A lot Costco. of practice. Uh, it, it comes with... looking for a little box that says better voice. Yeah, like better like voice. Costco. Just, I bet you it'll be like thirteen ninety nine. Yeah, Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh, you just got to... You just got to... If you have a good voice, then you need to practice with it because it's not just that your voice is deep or present, mm -hmm. um, you'd have to know how to use it. It's like any instrument. Yeah, Bill. Same old joke, how to get to Carnegie Hall, practice, practice, practice. And that's because your voice is muscles, whether it's the diaphragm or the, the jaw or mm -hmm. uh, lips or whatever, it's all muscles. If you're an athlete, you can't run well unless you run all the time. And if you're voice talent, you can't be a good voice talent unless you do you use your voice all the time, period. Yeah. Good, Courtney. It's physiognomy. It's, uh, it depends on a couple of things, practice, muscle control, and the shape of your vocal tract. You know, so the bigger lungs you have, the thicker vocal cords you have, the, uh, the larger sinuses you have all change the sound of your voice. And you can train your voice. You can talk up here in the top of your head and, and change your voice completely. Or you can resonate and learn to speak with uh, keeping your... Uh, throat open and resonating down in the chest, which gives you a deeper, boomy voice. So it can come with training. A good voice teacher can train you how to control those muscles and uh, and use those to achieve different, you know, vocal ranges. There is a, and I just can't find it right now. I think that there's a nonprofit uh, organization that does. They read. They do book reading for. This is mostly aimed at accessibility, taking books that are out of copyright. So the ones that are not, that books that were never put into some audio version and, and making those available. And uh, you can, you can just read those <laughs> like they're just happy to have you. Uh, the reason that that's interesting is because uh, especially if you're, because you're coming from Germany, you can do it in German for any of the ones that are already there. Uh, it just gives you a lot of practice. Reading books takes a long time. And if you do it and listen to it, it gives you a project to work on. Um, and uh, it also helps people when, as you're working through it. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I actually, that's how I started. After I took my radio training and was on the air for a while, I was off for a while. And so I volunteered for the service called Recording for the Blind in Phoenix back then. And they had me doing exactly that, reading college textbooks, including things like geometry and algebra, which is really weird. But you're constantly 
interpreting sentences and putting yeah. them out cleverly, and that's a great training thing. So if you can find some uh, volunteer circumstance like that, please do it. And, and if you're thinking about it as something you really want to do, you know, I, when people say, oh, that seems like a lot of work, that it would be like hours and hours and hours of reading something. I look at my daughter who spends uh, about an hour a day, two hours a day, practicing, practicing her bass, <laughs> you, know, like you know, and so it just takes uh, to, to, to develop what you're doing. It just takes a lot of hours. And so you just got to find something to practice on. And then you do want to get you know, get feedback from other people who do it. Um, you don't need to take lots and lots of lessons, but taking lessons periodically and having a professional listen to how you're approaching it, they're going to get into little things that you're doing with your voice that you could improve. A lot of us just did a lot of it and we got to where we where however good we got doing it that way. But the, um, but the thing is, is that having someone pick at what you're doing, it's really, you know, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And so without an expert to give you some feedback on your form, you can very quickly build a tick that is takes a lot of time to unwind. Um, so just, just think about that as well. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, to build on that, I would say, although it's very uncomfortable, don't be afraid to uh, play back your own recordings and listen to yourself because mm -hmm. oftentimes you don't realize the little quirks that you have until you actually hear it. Yeah, and, and you'll get to be very sensitive. When I'm doing a voiceover, I'm sure there's a bunch of us that do voiceovers on the show that they'll all say the same thing. I can listen to it and I go, oh, I just missed that last little, there was a little curve off at the end of that word that I, that I missed. Now, when I first started doing voiceovers, I didn't hear that at all. But after a couple hundred, you know, you, you get into a system where you, you realize I was just, my energy was off on that one word or I, I, I didn't breathe correctly or I didn't create the resonance I know I can do. And then you'll go back and work on it and you'll never get it to where you, I don't know. For me, I've never gotten them to where I like them. <laughs> I get them to where I give up. <laughs> like I just go, okay, that's as, good as it's, that's as good as today is going to be. So, all right. We're now going to change subjects to our second hour talking about light and magic. Uh, a little background here is that, and we're going to jump in. We're, one of the things we're experimenting with in the second hour is where to put the questions. So sometimes we talk for a while and, and then we, and sometimes it talks for a long time, but I think we're going to open up uh, to questions relatively early, but I'll give you a little setup of what, and I've got a little video to show a little later of just some examples and so on and so forth of what we were talking about. Um, the, but, but what I would say is that the, uh, it's not just that it's a fascinating story. So the light and magic story is really interesting. The industrial light, the, basically the buildup of how industrial light and magic, you know, came to be. But it's, it is, it's inspiring. It, it tells you like, they didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> they were just figuring it out. You know, like I always think of the, you know, like, um, do you know how to, like, I always think of Armageddon for some reason between the cat, that, are, that the chasm on the, on the astro on the asteroid. And they're like, he's like, do you know what you're doing? He goes, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, you know, I don't know what this, this thing does. All I know is I'm trying to get to this place, you know, and, and that's the way they, you know, in, in this light and magic, you just really get that everyone, they just a bunch of really smart people all got together and just started figuring something out and started you know, hammering on it until some, until frames came out the other end and, and then just kept on doing that. And a lot of it was a very scary thing for George, you know, and scary for a lot of people as they tried to work through it. So it's a really inspiring story. Uh, the, the part that we're going to look at a little bit later is also, it's just really well crafted. So, um, you know, it just, you don't, you don't see very many documentaries shot at a level and produced at a level that we see with this. So if you, are doing YouTube videos or doing documentaries or doing nonprofit videos or doing whatever. This is a mass, th this, this show is a master's course on how to build a documentary. Um, you know, usually you don't get these kind of budgets and, and it doesn't mean that, that you, you'll be able to do something with your stuff. But the reality is you could get close. It's, it's not about the cameras. It's not about the lights. I mean, you need a, a large light and you need a good camera. But it's really about the craft, craft, craftsmanship that is applied to this. And anytime I see something that's just incredibly well crafted, I want to tear it down. I want to look at it. I want to learn every, I want to suck out every like piece of knowledge that was put into that every frame because, you know, I'm just, I pack it away. And the next time I do a shoot, I try to hit that mark. <laughs> like, you know, and I, I won't, I won't have the budget to hit that mark exactly. I won't have the whatever, but I'm trying to train my eye. Your eye is what's important. And, and a lot of people can create incredibly look, look inc an incredible look. You can give an area to somebody who doesn't know what they're doing and they're going to shoot stuff that isn't inspiring. You can give a, 
you know, um, a, a much cheaper camera to someone who knows what they're doing and they're going to create an incredible picture. And so I think the pictures that we saw here are doable in a, let's say a 6K, um, you know, with, you know, relatively inexpensive lighting kit could get something close if the person who shot that was ch challenged with doing that, you know, and, and, um, and so uh, it's just a matter of knowing what you're looking at. And so that's what we're going to try to learn a little bit about today is knowing what we're looking at and really seeing how that's being put together. But I would highly recommend watching this a couple times. First, just watch it for the story, but then go back and look at like, what are they actually doing here? And look at the edit. The edit is perfectly paced, like perfect. We're not going to get into that as much, but perfectly paced. <laughs> you know, like every cut feels seamless, you know, because it's not, there's no jarring cuts there, even though they're cutting a lot. Like I noticed when I was researching this, that even though they're, they're not, they're cutting very often and sometimes little snippets of someone saying something for 15 frames or, or something like that, it feels natural. Like it doesn't feel like it's because it's in the right frame. You never feel like it was just a jarring cut to this person for 15 frames or 20 frames. And I didn't even notice that the first time I watched it, that they were going less than a second to somebody um, to, to fill something in and then going to the next thing. It's, 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 an, it's really well done. But the, again, the lighting, the framing of the interviews is unbelievable. Like this is like, if I could do, I just want to do that. <laughs> like, like, it's just amazing. And then I'll show a couple animations and some other stuff that they put into it that look very subtle and they are not like, like they're like, you know, like as someone who does this, I was like, Oh, I saw what they did there. Um, you know, and so they look like simple little animations and they are definitely not simple animations. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. It's like a master class in how to do a documentary and how good it is. Um, I was watching the 90s segment and uh, I saw my fellow classmate, uh, Jim Morris, who was running ILM, <clears throat> pardon me, running ILM uh, for a good bit of the 90s. And I just said, I don't know who, who the crew is that shot your documentary part and your, uh, your interview, but keep them around you because uh, they made you look great. Uh, and he uh, wrote back and said that uh, he thought that Larry Kasdan did a great job all the way around on that. And they were very impressed with it. Uh, he's at Pixar now. But uh, I think that the folks that got interviewed and the folks that were the subject uh, also recognize how great a production this was. And and the thing about that is, is that it, it's not just that they looked better. And I've I have shot. Uh, I've shot interviews with probably half of the people that were in this show. Uh, or, or had shows with about half of them that were there. And I definitely were, was, did not make them look as good as this. So, I mean, it was, they, they, you know, the lighting, the structure, the everything else is, was so well done. Um, and it, it just, they just looked amazing. And, and it wasn't just that they looked amazing. They had great energy, you know, like they have great, you know, the, and that's something you, you don't, you, to get that performance out of someone being interviewed is not just the lighting. It's not just the, you know, the sound, it, it, it is, per, it's generating a environment for the talent, the person you're going to put in front of the camera in a way that they're excited, they're interested, they're engaged, they're focused. They got all of that out of having them there. It, it could have been very hard to get that. And of course, that's a, there, there's probably hours and hours of edits that got down to that little bit that they're doing, but you have to, you, you have to get all of that right, or they're going to come across as flat. You know, and, and it's just, they, they did such a great job. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, and I think an important part of it is, it is uh, which makes it so captivating, is it tells a story. It has yeah. a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, uh, well, maybe not an end. It's kind of open-ended uh, <laughs> because they still exist. Yeah. But um, it, it tells the drama. There's a lot of drama, concern. There are people who become alienated in the middle that you don't realize. Uh, yeah. There's people that uh, whose careers are ended or renewed or, or start and started anew so you fo you follow along with those little dramas that happen along the way and don't realize of all this behind the scenes drama that was going on in the making of these movies uh, and, and you see uh, it covers a transitional period for the visual effects where where it uh, that whole business transitioned from optical and mechanical to computer graphics and uh, and pushing bits of data around. So uh, it covers how that transition happened and how it affected all the people that are involved. So that was yeah. what really made it interesting. And I think Lawrence Kasdan as a writer and a storyteller 
did a, a very competent job of linking all that uh, archival footage together to tell that story in one long arc. Yeah, and I'm hoping it's just season one. You know, like there's there's so much more to tell um, that this is this may not be. And for Disney, this is genius. And I'm hoping for all of our sakes that the other that all of the other streamers are seeing what Disney's doing, which is, oh, by the way, we can hold on to subscribers by doing tent poles, and that's great. But if we do documentaries about the tent poles, that's way cheaper, and that's still going to hold people. If I know that, um, you know, I'm watching more documentaries on Disney than I am watching content on Disney at this point. You know, like my the hours that I spend on Disney Plus is way more on the behind the scenes, the the you know all the bits and pieces there uh, than I am spending watching actual uh, narrative content. You know, so I think that there's a huge opportunity for Disney to dump into those archives. And just keep dredging up all kinds of great things for us to look at because they're most of these one of the advantages that we had when you watch this show is this is something for you to think about when you're doing productions that we try to think about i try to think about as much as i can sometimes you're in the middle of it you don't pay attention but it's really nice that they shot some good footage of them doing some of the stuff on star wars you know like this is that may, it's part of what makes this go um and and you know never forget to take at least photos of your behind the scenes i take a lot of photos and i try to get people to take photos it's really funny it's really hard for me to get other people to take good photos of behind the scenes of, of my productions um when i'm not there and it drives me a little crazy um, because uh, because I, that is how I talk to other people about how this got done. It's, it's a clinically, it's how I remember what I did and how to do it again. But it's also like, this is how we show clients, you know, this is how we set it up. And this is why it costs this and not $10, you know, is because there's a lot there. When you see something in front of the screen, look at all the stuff behind it. Um, let's go to the next question. Um, Sky, oh, I'm sorry, not Sky Gleason. Yeah, Sky Gleason, Seattle. What points in this documentary stood out to you? Good, Sky. When George said, I just want a pipe coming out of my head and going into a recording, <laughs> and it took him 40 years to make that happen and five had to start five different companies. And I am also on my second iteration of this uh, series. And anytime I would leave a theater and I can't remember where my car is parked, that meant that was a good story. I wasn't being critical. I was wrapped up in the story. And this series did that for me. So I'm, I'm very excited about now going back and, uh, like you say, deconstructing how they do things and how they did things. But I brought out tons of uh, how to do things, uh, the pioneering of something. And then the Again, when George came back from London and they only had six months to do 400 shots, well, it's because they didn't have the recipe or the ability before that. And so, again, the John Dykstra story is is uh, the rise and fall of of the talents and and why people wanted to stay together and and the fun and the the family of it all. So yeah, there's multiple points that I took away from it. And again, I look forward to seeing it again. But I also did watch the version of it that was done 20 years ago disney right. has that up there and it's like a different construct this is a whole new era of, of a way to do it the the interesting thing about that whole like i want to just have something come out of my head and just have that go up on the screen is that i think one thing that it illustrates is that that wouldn't have actually gotten the movie to be as good as it was a lot of what happened was you know, the, the art direction, the, the people who thought those things through, when you build a great crew to work on something, it's the sum is, you know, you know, the director always thinks that they can have it exactly, if they just had it exactly the way they wanted it, or the, the way that they imagined it, that would be a great movie. But usually if you have a great crew, and this is a great crew, and the Star Wars crews have always been pretty good, um, that you end up with something that is way more than you could imagine, you know, um, uh, there was a character, Terrell was a character, she's a character designer that was working on Star Wars and she just knew everything about animals. Like, and what she would come up with with all the creatures that you saw in episode one was not something that anybody was going to come up with because she understands all the muscles. So you can say, I, you can ask her to do something and she'll rebuild it, but it, it all works, you know, like, you know, from a, from a muscular perspective and, you know, and Jay Schuster, who's doing, um, 
uh, who did a lot of the ships, you know, what he really, he's a mechanical, he's an industrial designer, you know, like he understands how ships work, you know, and, and he, and so he would build all these ships with all the little bits and pieces that they needed. And so it's, but, it, but you, as a director, you're not going to think through those. You're going to want, you know, you, you need somebody else to think through those things. Go ahead, Bill. For me, the thing that stood out most was when I realized I was in watching Light and Magic, watching parallel construction in this sense. Uh, I kind of wrote a log line for Light and Magic and said, okay, what am I watching? I'm watching a plucky team of rebel misfit outsiders take on the Hollywood empire and eventually change the movie making universe. Where have I heard that before? <laughs> Right. That is exactly the arc of Star Wars. So I don't know if Kasdan did this by nature, but he literally in this echoes the work that he's talking about, which I think is brilliant because everybody's on board. Because the one thing you know is that anybody watching this has probably seen Star Wars. That's That to me is genius. Good, Courtney. Yeah, what stood out to me... Uh having worked with a lot of those people over the years uh, from time to time, is how old they are. <laughs> and it caused me to look in the mirror for all the contemporary footage and it went, oh, wow, Dykstra doesn't look yeah. anything like I remember him looking. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But, but it, it does, uh, you know, we don't necessarily, us behind the scenes people don't age well on camera. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, uh, Mitchell. Watching the show and seeing the very first electronic editing system, nonlinear editing system, the Editroid, the that was shocking to see, oh, that's it, and then why it was created, and then it's Genesis and uh, eventual uh, turning into an Avid. Um, the other thing uh, uh, that was an interesting uh, part of the story was when they really were convincing um, Spielberg to go to CGI for the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. Uh, up to that point, they were going to do stop motion, and it just wasn't convincing. But there was an aha moment there when they uh, showed... Uh, Spielberg, uh, some clips that they had of the Tyrannosaurus Rex running, uh, just amazing. And then the story behind the story of what was happening within the industry and the people that were working in their animation department and how they had to embrace this new technology and move with it or be left behind. Yeah, I, I, it, I was surprised. I, I wasn't certain that they were going to talk about that story because that's a in inside of what what I think was really good for story making is you had someone that was on the outside telling that story so that, you know, Kasdan knows that that's a good, there's some good drama there. Um, it, it's a pretty controversial story within ILM you know, of, you know, cause there was a, there was a pretty big pushback between a couple folks and, and uh, you know, Spaz definitely stepped out of his, uh, out of his lane to, um, to get that to happen. And they do tell that story really well. And um, they, and, you know, cause, you know and, and, and they do show a little bit of the the sadness of not doing the stop motion as well. And they, they touch on it enough that you feel it, but not so much that it gets, you know, you, you dig into it too too far. But I thought that they, it was a really, really well handled. But that that's a pretty well-known drama within the, when I worked there. Um, because it only happened a couple of years before I got there. Um, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, what stood out to me was that although the the people that started ILM were, I mean, they were clearly t very talented already. One thing that really spoke to me was just how much experimentation there was and that these were smart people, but they didn't know everything. And it was very much new frontier. And I love that they were just trying to figure stuff out. Yeah, I think that one of the things that I think average uh human resource folks do is try to find people that know all the answers that they need. Whereas the ones that really get the best teams are people who find the people who can figure things out because that's what, you know, they have, they have, they have a, they have a, they have a center of knowledge that's going to help them move forward, but they are able to. And, and I think that this is gets back into another film that isn't created related to this. I don't know why I keep on talking about Armageddon, but there's a lot of great quotes in Armageddon. And one of them is, you know, <laughs> Where they where they, they they haven't gone as many feet as they should, and he's like, "This is what happens when you drill." You know, like you know, like this is the way it works. You know, is that you're not going to get you. We don't can't follow your little your little cards. You know, and and I think that uh, and I think that that is where you have people figuring things out that are it's an imperfect situation. No one's ever done this before, um, and you're you have to figure it out. And that's what I'm always trying to do is find teams that I can surround myself with of people who can figure their way out of the solution, not people who knew how to do it when they got there. Go ahead, Bill. 
Another thing that I, it struck me is the three P's of talent. That was a little note I wrote to myself when I thought I might be doing this. Uh, passion, perspiration, and perseverance. This came out to me over and over again. First of all, that team was highly passionate. They came because they wanted to be there. Once they got there, they worked their butts off yeah. to do this. And the perseverance, even in the face of things not going right, they kept going until they got it right. So it caused me to think a lot about what talent really is. And I remember listening to somebody saying it's the desire to continue to improve. And I kind of think, yeah, you know, that ability to remain motivated and sustain your desire to improve is really what a lot of us call talent. There may be some some organic thing you have to be able to see something, or, but Everybody I know who's talented has maintained that desire to incrementally improve over a long period of time. And that's what usually gets them to the top of their industry. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Courtney. Yeah, it, it well illustrates the, you know, the conflict between visionaries and actuaries. You know, what the visionaries are just trying are concentrating and trying to come up with the best way to do something irregardless of, of how long it takes or how much it costs. And the actuaries are there going, hey, guys, we got to deliver this in, in three days. You know, I don't care what you do, but we've got to, it, it's got to be done in three days. And, or we have, you know, $12,000 to finish this shot. So figure out a way to do it for the budget. So there's that constant struggle in Hollywood of cost versus, uh, you know, vision. And to how do you realize your your vision at the cheapest at at an affordable cost, uh, so it doesn't bankrupt the company? And a lot of that's been the downfall of many 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 visual effects companies because they're full of visionaries that have great ideas and can come up with really imaginative ways solutions to shooting things and creating things that look amazing on on film, but uh, then they have to work within the business schedule and they're not. The you know visionary people are not very good at business, so that's why it's always good to bring in the business guy to take care of mm -hmm. the bottom line. After go all, ahead. it is show business. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, uh, Alex. Yeah, I think managers in every single organization across. I think this covers across all industries. One thing that they could really learn is to focus on creativity and building. On your point earlier, Alex, was that um, that creativity is something i feel that we lose as adults and the just watching how the people at ilm worked there's this innate um childlike mentality of they're just open to new ideas open to concepts open to play and that's something that we lose and i think that's super valuable yeah next question alex knight in vancouver bc do we know what cameras and lenses were used to shoot the ilm documentary it looks gorgeous I will um, guess that they're Aries. I mean, they have that kind of, they have the what looks like the knee of an Aries. <laughs> so so the, the, the color signs in the Aries are really nice. And so my guess is, is that they're, they're, they're Aries, Ariel F or, or something like that. Um, is, it, you know, could be uh, what I would guess or what I would probably, what I would get to shoot this if, if someone asked me to. Uh, I have no idea what the lenses are. It could be Zeiss Super Speeds. It could be Anjanou, um, you know, probably somewhere in there. It looks like they have one wide, one close. So that, you know, for everybody, that's a pretty traditional interview style is to um, is to have two cameras so that you can cut out things um, by cutting closer or by making it more intense or less intense, depending on the framing. But it looks like they had a two frame, a two, it was a two shoot, a two camera system. Um, and again, Airy would be the, the the most traditional way to approach um, this and it would it would give you the the most to work with. Um, that said, I definitely think that you could take a um, a six K you know Black Magic with a relatively good lens, probably not a still lens, but a you know an Anjou lens or a Fuji lens, and get something that was ninety percent that. I mean, I, I, again, I'm not gonna. I would never bid it out that way, <laughs> but, but I would, but you could, it's, it's really about the art of the framing of the system of the process, uh, that, that, you know, you could get close to this with many, many different cameras, um, to get to this highest level. I think that you'd probably end up with Aries and really expensive lenses to make that work. And a lot of lighting. I, I, you know, I think that we'll look at the frames when we look at it, but it's not just, you know, a key fill lighting system it's there's a lot going on there um go ahead uh, courtney 
Uh, Alex will probably disagree with, with me on this, but I like the fact that it wasn't shot with an Interatron, so that it had all the interviewers were talking to an unseen interviewer. All the interviewees were, sh were shot looking off camera to the left uh, as if they were talking to an unseen interviewer. Uh, and that gives you more flexibility with multi-camera so you can cut more to a profile without being so jarring if you're cutting from an Interatron where they're looking directly into the lens to a profile where they're looking off into space it's right. a little more jarring and i think keeping it inter you know as if they're speaking to an unseen interviewer uh gives you more flexibility in that kind of coverage and i think it looked great yeah go ahead bill yeah and i was just going to mention i was doing a little research for tomorrow's camera show and and so the top end aries 30 to i'm sorry 50 to eighty thousand dollars for the camera system and then a lens can be thirty to fifty thousand dollars for the lens. So up at that level, you're working with the best of the best, and you would expect them to be doing that. So they probably have a hundred thousand dollars worth of camera clip and easily plus plus, and it can, with all the extras, easily run up into a couple of hundred thousand dollars. And but the thing I want to talk about when we talk about the technical ends of things is that is that I do think that you could get very when we study what's actually happening here you could get 80, 90% as good with a $10,000 system. Like it just, you know, just, I just, that's what I want to keep on. You know, would you do it that way? Would you manage it that way? I don't think so, but uh, you know, for this level of a shoot, but we want to learn that one of the reasons I want to look at this is we want to learn from what we saw there and get that, you know, we could get the, we want to close that gap, mine the gap between where they are and where we are and how do we use the tools that we have to get as close to that as possible. Let's go ahead and look at some of the frames and we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, so here's the, uh, oops, the wrong thing here. Let me uh, get this, right, I'm cutting a little blind here. There we go. Um, let me make this, uh, program. all right. So, uh, you know, this is, you know, the beginning of the, this is the close up, and um, one of the things you're going to want, things you want to notice is this is a little out of focus, but not a lot out of focus. Um, and this background, you'll notice in almost all of these, the backgrounds are way back there. Um, you know, so they used a very large cavity to do this show, shoot. Wherever they put everybody, they um, they went. This is probably a solid twenty, thirty feet behind them. Um, and and by doing that, you can have a longer, uh, you can have a a a. a, um, a you can have more depth of field so you can you can stop down a little bit so that you're not having this when you have someone with a something five feet behind and you want it to be this soft what you end up having to do is open up to 1.4 or 1.8 or 2.8 or whatever that is and now their nose is out of focus and their eyes are in focus or vice versa sometimes um when you have if you put them in a large space you can you can stop down and make sure that wherever they lean forward and back that they're going to get um you're going to get the uh, they're still going to be in focus, but that background is going to be a nice, you know, soft bokeh. I also really liked, I felt like they did this very, um, I, this is the new, this is what I see more often than anything else is people just dropping, uh, lower thirds as text onto the thing and not really making it, not animating it, not making it goofy, just putting up a text that just tells you who, who you're looking at, um, there, uh, other things to look at. We'll see this over and over again. Um, and, uh, is, you know, there's, this is obviously one of the things that, that I do very quickly if I like someone's lighting is I look at their eyes because this is going to tell you where your eye is going to, it's not only the soul, <laughs> the, the window to the soul, it's the window to the lighting. Um, so when you look at someone's eyes, you can, if you get, if you have a high enough resolution, you can actually figure out, I mean, I, I'm not going to do it here, but uh, you can usually figure out almost exactly how big the, the light source was, at least in its relationship to them. My guess is, is that the light source for him is about, um, it's up here and it's about probably one or two feet. It's probably a four by four, one or two feet outside of the frame. Like it's really close, maybe a little bit further back, but no more than, it's probably no more than four or five feet from his face. And it's probably about a, at least four feet by four feet, um, you know, and it's probably got a, uh, we can see that it's the way that it's, it's, it's lighting here. It most likely has an egg crate on it um, to make that work. And so, so that, that's my guess, you know, looking at that, at, at um, uh, that lighting. So you have a really strong, obviously key in here there, there, are, there may be, I don't even see a reflector in his eye. So there's, pro there's very little, it's very, you know, um, 
cinematic. He does have a hair light up here. So there's a little bit, they're picking up his hair. Otherwise that would just drop right off, but it's very, very subtle. It's mm -hmm. super, super subtle to grab some detail there. And then of course there, you know, there, there's a lot of, and you'll see this in the background. The, the backgrounds are very well lit. As you look at all the backgrounds, I don't know if I have all of them. They definitely shot this in one or two spaces and then just change the angles and the, and the framing for each one. Um, let's see here. Let's grab onto this. Um, here's the wider shot here. And again, I think that this would be hard to, oops, this would be hard to light without some kind of uh, reverse lighting there. But again, and this is where you, you know that this has to be a little bit out of here because, but it's probably, it's probably almost as close as they could make it. Um, you know, here that also allows you to uh, make the light large and not as bright on him because it's, you know, it's closer to him, uh, you know, the, the, the physics of, of light. So, um, but really well done. Obviously we, what is lit up is very balanced. So he's over here in this frame and they've got some detail over here. If there was no detail over here, you wouldn't have that. And it's again, very nice and out of focus. It implies a production area, uh, but it, it doesn't, you know, distract you with it. Um, Alex, but, do you think he's got a big silk over his head? Um, he, from above? I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, it's really, really subtle. Like it's just enough to pick up, pick that up. I don't know for sure, um, but but I but it, it it I wouldn't be surprised if they if he had a, a larger one. It won't be a really big silk because there's not. If it was a really large silk and it was lit, this would pick up some ambient light from it. Yeah, so a lot of wrap around his. I'm face. also looking at his yeah. right sleeve. The shadow ca cast by that fold is very sharp. So yeah, it so me I don't think maybe not any diffusion yeah. over the top light. And there might be a little bit because I feel like this right here is something coming from a from a from above. I think um, because you see it right here. This would this would catch this or this. I think would catch a shadow right here that we, that, you know, this would not be seen. So I think that there is a light behind him um, that's there, but it may be behind him, not above him and, and very diffuse and very subtle. And it's just there to um, catch that outline, you know, just to separate him from the background. And so if he didn't have that, I think you wouldn't have this line right here. You'd have this, this is, this to here is coming from that light. But what you wouldn't have is this little area right here, I don't think. Um, maybe this one catches it from the behind. But I think that that that's my guess is that this, that one little light is is uh, is coming from um, because you can see some conflict of the shadow um, and uh, this shadow and something coming from back here. So it, I think it was behind him um, that was there. And again, we're just you know all of us are guessing to some degree. It's nice um, and dramatic. And uh, the cinematographer was uh, Emily Topper. I think she did most of the episodes mm -hmm. and and most of her credits, almost all of her credits. She has fifty five credits in IMDb, and mm -hmm. almost all of them are documentaries. So she does a lot of these talking head yeah. stuff. I think she's going down pat. Let's, let's get her. Let's get her on the show. Um, this I I think um, based on some stuff. I, I I think this is actually Joe's office. Um, uh, so it's, um, it's, uh, there, this is, he's got a desk and a thing over, over there. Um, and so I think that this is, this is his, his office. And, and, um, so they, they really, you know, again, catch lights here that, um, are well lit that are building balance for him. You know, so he's, I, I did find it interesting, you know, they really on this wider shot, you know, there, they, there is a lot of space behind him, but it makes sense on the wide shot here. Um, and then but again, this lighting here not only hints to what's back there, but um, but the uh, it hints to what's back there, but it also creates weight on that side of the frame. That is uh, that I think is is really good. Again, just gorgeous lighting and very consistent. Obviously, you have the same DP that's making sure that everything looks the same, so everything belongs together. Sometimes you lose that in documentaries. Um, one thing to miss this this is a windows back here, and they. <laughs> a lot of windows like that can get pretty bright. So you're either finding the right time of day or you're, um, or you're covering them up and relighting them to, to, to give them that detail, um, that, uh, that, that, that would be needed there. So that couch top brightening is brilliant because that gives yeah. you his shape and that little tiny splash yeah. of light on his other shoulder defines him for you. Even the seam, even though he's black against black, that's yeah. beautiful. Absolutely. Great little animation. Like this is again, a subtle thing. Where was it? Oh, did I miss that? Hold on. Like this is a really 
you know, he's talking about something. And one of the things that I think they do exceptionally well is they visually tell the story. One of my complaints about documentaries is when we sit and watch people talk for a long time and they're talking about something and you're like, well, show us, show, you know, there's some, you know, don't, don't talk about it. Show us some visual that illustrates that. And that's expensive and time consuming and everything else. And I thought that what they did here to show us what, you know, what had to happen, um, you know, the nice little animation going along the map. It, it's simple, it's probably done, you know, in After Effects or something like that. It's not, there's nothing difficult about it. Nice little zoom in. So again, look at how they did it. There's a lot of different ways you could have done this. Um, the, you know, while it looks like it's just sitting on a desk, my guess is, is that it's a comp you know, <laughs> that's, that's there. And, um, you know, in a 2D comp here, and then they're, they're doing a slow Ken Burns style with a little animation, and then they're going to snap to it, you know, there to kind of tell that story, but there's ease in, there's ease out, there's, you know, they're, they're doing it inside of their frame, you know, and, and a little circle. Now look, it's not a circle. It looks like a hand drawn circle. Like it's like, oh, I have it right here. You know, that was, you know, maybe someone did that as an alpha channel and then, and then put it in there, but, but it was, you know, animated, it was animated along this line around this in this animation, you know, and those are the kind of things we want to, like, when you see something like this, you want to back up and dig into it and look at like, how did they actually construct it? What I used to do when I first started getting into animations is I would take a shot like this and I'd reproduce it. Like I would just, I'm going to do the shot. I'm going to do this shot. And I'm going to get as close to the, I, I, that's how I learned to do animation for, for TV was I just took shots that I thought were impressive. And I, and I just spend weeks doing a shot and, and the, you know, and, and, um, and getting, getting through that. Yeah. What were you gonna say, Courtney? The, the clever thing is too, that they used the Thomas brothers map, which was the means of mapping in that area at that time that this yeah. was going on. Like, you know, you'll see in an Indiana Jones movie, you know, where they'll cut to the map and they'll right. show the airplane flying from one country to another country. So it takes exactly. that mentality and takes it into a more modern, but, uh, a appropriate uh imagery for that period of time that's really uh, imaginative yeah this is a great one lauren um and so again now we're taking you a different set very similar kind of you know lighting that you had there um and then uh you know this is you know kind of a shelving area i'm i'm curious as to where they i think that they might have shot some of these in i think some of the stuff this might be the model shop at i uh you know at and in d building that's still there um and I don't know, I don't know that for certain. Um, let me, uh, but again, there's your close up, and you'll see that that little move there. So you have a camera operator sitting there and, and one of the mistakes that people make when they do the animations is that they, when someone pulls out a frame, they quickly frame up, you know, to, to reframe them and watch what, but this camp, this is obviously a very skilled camera operator who's done a lot of this and watch what happens is he's gonna pull back and then you'll see the camera just lets him finish his move and then and then moves up subtly and you don't even notice it really unless you're looking for it you don't notice that it's there um you know um another great background and again this is you know obviously not by accident <laughs> you know over here that's balancing his frame you know it's not competing with him but it's balancing his frame so that he's not so that the frame is not out of uh you know out of balance and I, and um Let's see here. Let's uh, jump through here. There's there's your wide shot here, and um, you know so there's your wide shot, and again a nice balanced frame here, a little bit of detail here, but not enough. All of this is implying a workshop without distracting you. You what you don't it's it's far enough out of focus back here that you don't feel like you're going to try to figure out everything that's back there. You could, your eye looks at it. We did this a lot when we were working on film is we would put things in the depth of field because we want to, we want you looking here, right? We don't want you looking over here. So we're going to, but we give you the feel of where you're at and then you're at a shop or you're at something like that. Um, but what we don't want, and, and a lot of times this could be, um, you know, constructed, you know, looking at this, I don't know how they built this, but this could be very much, this is a staircase going down. This is a desk put, dropped in. This could be, this could have been done in the set that's in our office, you know, in, in the stages in our office, because, you know, all of these things could just be brought in. These lights are at you. You could go to his location, but you can, this set is so big. This very much could be just set up in a set somewhere and laid out and planned so that everything has the right look. And, and one thing to look at here is you have a bluish light here 
and the and the warmer lights here. So there's a contrast there. It's not all it's all not all lit in one way. This is a complex setup. I would love to see the behind the scenes of this. Of do, you, shoot. do you think they shot with two cameras or did they over over scan and then they shot with two cameras? Punch, punch in. Absolutely. There you go. So yeah, absolutely a, shot. A, wide, a wide and a close at the same time. Yep. Got There's it. One, one of the reasons you do that as well, number one is it also lets you, it doesn't look, you, it'll look like a jump cut. If you're just jumping from the, if you take one camera with let's say 8K or 4K and you're going to cut back in, and again, this is probably produced at 4K. So now, now you need an 8K camera to cut into it. And then the other situation you get into is the depth of field. So when you cut to that closer shot, number one is it changes angle. So you can cut between the two, but also the depth of field shortens because you're zoomed in further. And so uh, we used to do that where we cut wide and we still do it where, we, where we'll shoot this at a higher resolution than our delivery, twice the resolution of our delivery so that we can cut to the close up. But the problem you get into is that the depth of field should have gotten like a lot of times if we're shooting wide, this one's really shot well and wide, and, um, but a lot of times this might be in, in more focus than we want for the wide shot. And when we cut in, we still have the same focus. And it, it actually is something that you notice as a, you can notice as a, as a, um, as a viewer that it just doesn't feel as cinematic well, or as, as and real. And again, you don't know why you don't yeah. know what it was, so but feel you, right. but you, yeah, it's the feel of it. Yeah. Thank you. He's there, also you know, changed. Perfect. He's also changed from, um, Dennis Edlin has a, uh, stage left key and he has a stage right key and that's because of the people I think I'm expecting that they change the key light side because the shot didn't look right enough if they kept think, going well and I think I that, see that a lot bouncing back and forth I think that they're Just, always I think that they're in all of these I think they're always lighting from the wide side Right. So they're always, so yeah, if they're, that's if, a broad if, side if, key. If got, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that they're, I think that's how they're, which would feel, it'll feel, it'll feel very backwards if you don't do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've seen people make so, that mistake and try yeah. to key from the short side. It's a different, it almost looks like a horror movie shot when you do that. Yeah, exactly. You always have, you always, what we're talking about here is, um, for those watching is you always, this wide side, this, the broad side here, you're always lighting from that. Your key is almost always coming from that direction for an interview as opposed to the other, the other way around. Um, Again, nice little setup there. Here's Dennis Muir. Now, the the interesting thing here, let's see if they go to the wide here so that we can see. Let's see. And then this is a this is a different setup. His setup and the matte painter setup are both the same. I mean, they did it in the same location. Most of them are in different, you know, distinctly different locations um, that are there. But again, the thing to notice here is that this could be a lot of different things back here. Um, where it is, it can be a I mean, we've done things like that where it literally is just boxes back there. Like there's boxes or or things that we built that can be back there. When they're that soft, you can get away with a lot of things. Um, this is another wide shot here. Or another uh, interview shot. Let's see if they, I think they, whoop, there we go. So this is like a warehouse, you know, somewhere. <laughs> you know, so it's a warehouse. But again, what they did is uh, you have that lighting that we saw before. In this case, it's probably he's probably not lit by these lights, but they inspire the direction of that light. You know, when you have a bright light there, this is a motivated lighting, you know, from the lighting that you see back here. Um, they are probably affecting, you know, some of this here, um, but a big unfinished area. And and again, very large. I mean, I don't know how far that is, but that is probably 30, 40 feet to the back wall here, um, you know, for the for the shoot. And so that is a, um, you know, and that just really, I've noticed this, I know there was the, the network, not the network, the movie, but the one about the social networks where they use these huge cavities to shoot. Um, I, I really love that look, you know, for those, for those there. Also, I don't know if like you can find idea. that Dennis. Oh, go ahead, Carney. I also like the idea of in that garage setup, uh, that the light coming through the windows is used as a practical excuse for lighting from that side too. Exactly. Motivated from that side. Absolutely. You know, that, I don't know if you can find the Dennis beautiful. Mirren shot, but look at how well they handle his glasses. That is a, that is absolutely perfect. He's wearing glasses, but you're, the, yep. the angles of them, there is nothing that's infecting your ability to see his eyes. It's just pure. And that's not, definitely didn't just happen. Like, not at all. <laughs> like when you see For those of us who have shot corporate yeah. interviews and have tra spent a half an hour trying yeah, to get you can see that they moved it up. The you're, you're seeing a little bit of it right here. So it's it's up at this angle, right? But they had to move it to a point where it was going to not not show up in his glasses. Let's see here. We'll go forward. Lo love the Ray Harryhausen 
Yeah. And, I mean, and again, things. the amount of historical footage, I'm so jealous, but that's what you can do when you have a budget. And, but they also shot so much of it. I love seeing George then talking about himself in, you know, the George now and the George then. And there's the wider shot. So this is the, and again, this is, this is not as large a, a, a space, So, but it is still, you know, we've done stuff where it's very, um, the, the motif is kind of there to do that. And I know we're running out of time. So we're um, going to go pretty fast through some of these things here. Um, Alex, what is the motion blur do you see on their hand motions tell you about how they shot that? It's just, it just looks like film motion blur. They're just moving quickly. It's 24 frames a second. Yeah. Doesn't look, it doesn't look unusual to me. It looks like it's right. 180 degree, 24. I don't, this type of film, no one would get experimental <laughs> with, with it's that. It's interesting that they lit Ron Howard so uh, dramatically, yeah. but everybody knows what Ron Howard looks like on the planet. So they're not trying to say, look at this guy. They're right. going, oh my God, it's Ron Howard. <laughs> right. There's George. George now, yeah. And usually there's the wider shot you're looking at, it gives you more construction, I think. Yeah, I think that that's in the main house. That's the, I think that's the living room in the main house uh, at, at Skywalker Ranch. You can see when you go fast, you see all the, um, this is what I wanted to show. So they're talking about how they, how they need to construct these. This is, and by the way, this is such a, a John Dykstra. I love, this is my favorite frame in the whole thing. Like of all of these things, just you're behind, you're backstage. You know, this is behind, you know, staging flats. So this is what it looked like behind a lot of these sets where you have the the stuff here. I don't even know where they shot this, but it's just, I, this is my favorite one of all of them. I like the Phil Tippett one really a lot. And then I like this one I thought was just, um, just this beautiful shot of him. And I'm really glad that they, uh, you know, this could be a two-part series. We could do this again next week. Yeah, exactly. This is the, the, what I wanted to show There's is so like also there. some of the effects. Yeah. So uh, this is such an amazing animation. Like, so I just want to say like it's, it, it was a blimp, uh, a blip going by. But so this is a 3D model. This is not a 2D animation. This is a 3D model um, with, with uh, you know, inverse kinematics and everything else. So look at that. You see the, it was when I noticed it is when I looked at this here, um, when you, when you actually look at the cable, the cable is flexing properly. It's not just that it's bending. The coils are pulling, subtly pulling in and out. Like that, this is a lot of work. Just let you know. I mean, this is not something someone th threw together. Um, but there's I, a lot of hand drawn elements of that because the top part you know, where the the top part of the head that the curve is rotating through is all hand drawn because the nuts are not regular shaped they're individually drawn right yeah so there's there's parts that are 2d and then there's parts that are are 3d you know in in what they're doing here and it gives it this i'm giving you a drawing like it's just so well crafted i'm giving you something that looks like a drawing but it's not you know, and it's rendered out as a tune filter, you know, just, just the edges, but even that kind of thing, when you're doing a technical tune filter in that area where it's only a uh, boundary, and this looks like a tune filter of boundary edges only. And even then you get all kinds, and there's a little bit, every once in a while, I saw a little bit of errata in, in some of the edges, but, but it is, I mean, just so well done. And, you know, I don't know for sure, but my guess is that the numbers are probably accurate. Plus you know, the whole like, shot is panning as he goes that, that there's a lot going on there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, that's a 2d, yeah. 2d move on it, but all those things, it's, it, it, it is just a, a, something as simple as that is super well crafted. Notice that this is just a little out of focus, um, which wouldn't be accurate, but it, you know, just a little softer. These, these, these lines on either side are just a little softer than, than what you see here. Um, you know, that's there. And there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a vignette you know, on it that gives it that little, you know, um, that feel to it, but really, really just a beautiful, beautiful setup. Um, and then here's another one here. And again, what we're looking at is something that's very simple. Um, is now you can see what I was talking about here. If you look at this bottom area, this might've been on purpose, but this is usually the kind of stuff we see with a, with a boundary edge where the edge changes a little bit, kind of moves around. Um, but anyway, but the, uh, Oh, no, it's actually just turning. Yeah, never mind. Um, so anyway, the, but just 
the arrows here are telling you like this is the way all e-learning should be in my opinion <laughs> it's like like if we're going to explain something technical to you we're going to you know think about it work work through it but you know this is the kind of thing that you want to see with everything and then we're going to cut right to what i just showed you here are some images that that tie back into exactly what's there now this is a great and this is a great example of explaining you know this this map painting here so here you can see the map painting and again it's just so nice they, they still have this footage but you're seeing this is what it actually looked like on set you see george talking there another i think this was in the same uh the same location as ralston um and anyway but this was i thought this was a really good you know little animation where we show you you know we're delivering you not just before and after but we kind of paint it in um and you know great interview here and then we're going to show you um you know there's there it is there and i love love that he was making fun of the storyline though and yeah, yeah why, he was like i don't understand why they did that why, but and then and then they show you the, the actual they show you the actual mat of what it needed to look like. And then they're, this is why you want to shoot behind the scenes. And then, and I'm sure that one of the reasons they used this shot specifically and spent so much time on it is because they had all these clips. You know, they're like, oh, we have a clip of this and this and this. And now we're projecting, you know, the, the frame into it. And that, you know, and, and that, that total transition, I'm sure, took quite some effort, you know, to get and this that is, done. This is the luxury of the new distribution path. Now, a single documentary is what we had 20 years ago. Now we've yeah. got eight yeah. And it's parsed out and you can take longer with the story and, yeah. and go dig deeper. Awesome. So anyway, that, so that's, that's the, um, uh, that's the, that's the look anyway, just worth us looking at because it was, there were so many parts of it that were crafted so well, you know, and, and as people who do, whether it's YouTube videos or Instagram videos or, interviews or e-learning or anything else anything anytime someone does something at this high level it's just really worth you know looking at it closely we'll call we'll do this probably at least once a month with something where we dig into something that's just really well crafted and go okay what happened there like how do we learn from that how do we take their millions of dollars of investment and you know glean a little bit of new knowledge out of it let's jump to the questions real quick and see what we can get through in the next couple minutes all right, the next one comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas, and he says, talk about all the locations of ILM. Are they in San Francisco and Marin County both? Uh, they used to be in Marin. Now they're on islands only in uh, the Letterman Project in nor just north of, just part of the northern part of uh, of uh, San Francisco. So that's that's where they all are now. But they used to be in Marin. They actually used to be in the building that our, the 090 offices are in. So, um, yeah, the next question. Andy Kokendorfer, VR Florida. Can you diagram the lighting plot for one of the L&M interviews? Eye lighting? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm going to guess that the person, if the person's here, there's a really large source right here, and that's the main key. Um, you know, the camera's here, and it's probably, you know, here. The There is potentially a very, very subtle key, I mean, uh, rim lighting that is that is behind them. I don't see any evidence of a fill light you know, in, in these, um, that are, that are there. And then there's a bunch of, again, if you have the person here, there's a bunch of like little, I bet what's really complicated is how they're lighting the background. <laughs> like the background is I'm sure, uh, you know, a lot of lights that have been figured out, you know, it, again, when we looked at Phil Tippett's, there's, uh, there's, there's some blue light, there's some warm lights, they're, they're all pocketed. They're all exactly, they're probably, you know, so a lot of things there. Yeah. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I was going to say also noted that uh, exposure is really a critical thing about lighting because they have a single key. It looked like a single softbox key to me, too. And I agree with Alex. There may have been a little rim light that they could bring up or down. All of those are infinitely controllable. So you start with how much ambient lighting is in this space they're shooting at. There's yeah. almost nothing except a completely blacked out room that has none. And then whether you bring your key light up or down depends on whether the exposure yeah. allows the room to be brighter or dimmer. Mm -hmm. So you're balancing always ratios of lighting that you're yeah. contending with on any set. Yep. Yeah. Next question. Uh, Kyle Hammond in Chicago, Illinois. I've noticed several interior auto splices while watching Light and Magic. I'm curious the panel's thoughts on edits to fit the story versus time. Go ahead, Courtney. I think what he's talking about there is uh, the sound that you hear when you hear a, uh, a 
splice, a physical splice in film going through a projector with an optical pickup. So you hear that uh, go by when a splice goes by. And they use that for a couple of times, I think, just to, to take you back into that uh, familiar sound of anybody who's worked in an editing room for many years, yeah. uh, used to hearing that sound. So it's kind of a, a, an audio callback. You know. Yeah, it's there's a lot of really subtle. So we didn't even get into the sound design of it, but it's it's really well done. Next question, Alex Knight in Vancouver, BC. What do you think? What do we think of the business case, the return on investment for making this documentary? I'm glad it was made, but surely the target audience size who watches ILM was only a fraction of those subscribers who would watch a Marvel movie. A bill, real quick. Yeah. Um, Part of this is content. They need content for these services like Paramount Plus and all these things that are not the standard HBO or Cinemax or something. And so mm -hmm. I think this is their mining, their history to bring content to stay relevant yeah. in the modern era. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, Disney has a whole department on doing these behind-the-scenes films, and they're going back. A friend of mine has directed a lot of them. They've gone back to Lady and the Tramp, a lot of the animated films, and find anyone who's still surviving, and they go back into the Disney archives and pull out the uh, a lot of the original artwork, and they construct these documentaries. They're originally designed for included as to be included as extras on the DVDs, but now they're archiving them and putting them on in streaming as an additional. Um, the only way you can see these is is if you sign up for the stream. So it's a, a motivation to get you signed up to a, a long subscription instead of just buying the DVD. Yeah, there's no reason, in this case, they're, they're not trying to sell individual tickets. And so the reality is, is that you just have to have enough of this coming out on a constant basis to keep people, is it worth eight bucks or 10 bucks a month to keep on getting this content um, as well as all the other stuff. I will argue when you look at the cost of this documentary, which I'm sure was millions, but not hundreds of millions, you could argue that the ROI on the documentaries may be higher than the R the ROI on the Marvel films that, you know, that, that, you know, or, or something that goes out because now if the Marvel film was completely paid for by a theatrical, then there's a lot of ROI because it didn't cost you anything more to do. But if you, um, but, but I think that if you were making something that's solely for Disney plus that your ROI on these documentaries. Now the problem is they don't make any money unless the main content is drawing you in because you're interested in how that got made. But um, I think that this one is way more interesting than the Mandalorian behind the scenes or some of the other ones because they were a little too superficial. These ones really dig into it. I think they could do six episodes on every series. Like they, they could have done, you know, tons of this for the Mandalorian. They did six episodes. They did one for each, but each one of those could have had six, <laughs> you know, breaking it down and people will watch it. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, like it doesn't, you know, and these are relatively inexpensive to, to make compared to all the other content that they're using to hold people. Next question. Dave Troutman in Edmonton, Canada. Would the attention to detail in this production be a reflection of the accuracy the team had when they made the movies? Yeah, I mean, the people who made the movies aren't making the documentary, but I think that they definitely knew that they definitely took this seriously. You know, like they, like this is a we're gonna knock this all the way out of the park, you know. And 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 they pick the right team, they pick the right, produ you know, production, the the right planning, the right writing. I mean, it was it's just all the attention to detail over everything is amazing. Uh, next question, Peter Belbean in Houston says there seems to be a nice consistency in terms of the unseen interviewer being to the right of camera with the subject angling across from the right of center. But will you be adding a behind the scenes documentary crew to your budgets? A lot of people do have a documentary crew to their budgets, uh, you know, I mean, so that is, uh, you know, you know, when Star Wars was being done, when I was working on Star Wars, there was a crew, at least one camera operator every time George was in a meeting. Like there's just thousands of hours of him having discussions. Yeah, Courtney, real quick. Yeah, I worked on a lot of those crews. I was in the behind the scenes crew and second unit on E.T. And every time Spielberg had something to do, we would shoot with the... And mm -hmm. All of his stuff was shot in 35 millimeter. They'd use the B camera. John Toll was the the DP on the second unit on ET. So I, he and I would wander around, him with the handheld Panaflex and me with the Nagra, and record a lot of stuff behind the scenes. And that's the footage you end up with in a lot of this stuff now these days. Yeah, Bill. BTS stuff and an on-set photographer. I mean, we're talking about, Alex was just talking about the fact that he wish he had more coverage of what's going on so he can explain it. Uh, I've been on movie sets where they had a, an official photographer doing nothing but that behind the scenes stuff. Next question. Stefan Fischer in Würzburg, Germany. Uh, what is a silk? Uh, so it was large 
large diffuse, diffuse um, it, it allows light to go through it. Um, it's usually a big white silk. <laughs> it's a different different uh, and it uh it's very very dense and very small and you 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 can project light through it and make it a big diffuse area a lot of times when you're looking at outdoor stuff you're actually seeing silks because when we do something on a beach or something like that we actually it looks like they're just standing on the beach but a lot of times we have this huge sail that's a 10 by 10 or 20 by 20 silk that's over top of them that um diffuses the light on them otherwise it'd be, it just wouldn't look as nice you can always tell when someone's got budget because they got silks <laughs> go ahead bill yeah, you can order them up in different uh, densities, one-stop, half-stop, two-stop silks, and that if a cinematographer understands exactly what they're getting, how much diffusion by doing that. Yeah. Uh, next question. Uh, Sky Gleason, inspired by the ILM, INM, L&M documentary, robot operator John Neeris created the trench shot, and he has a link to it. Any thoughts? Go ahead, Sky. Well, my friend was inspired by what he saw in the film. And I was watching John, I'm sorry, George was inspired by the historical footage from World War II. And John was saying, yeah, it took me a whole hour to make this look good. And then he went back looking at the documentary and saying, yeah, a shot like this was like a month of, oh, of, yeah. of effort. And John was doing this and tweaking. And, and now he can take that metadata and put it onto his robot. Yeah. In real war, in real time. So it's. Well, I'm it's, curious that he hand animated that. What would be really interesting, I realized when I was seeing what he did, I was like, you yeah, know, you could track the old shots and then, and then put them back into, uh, you know, r figure out the arm from backwards. It'd be kind of fun for no, for no good reason other than to spend a week. You, you will inspire John. He, I know he's listening. So, uh, yeah, we'll that'd be really cool. It's really great animation. Yeah. Really cool. Uh, last question. And our last one goes to Douglas Carmichael. Was there much discussion of the technology ILM used over the years, including the infamous Rebel Mac unit? All right, go ahead, Courtney. I don't know about the Rebel Mac unit. I didn't hear about that. But there was discussion about the technology that Dijkstra inventing the Dijkstra Flex, which was the first motion control camera rig, so they would have repeatability so that they could run one piece of film through the cameras, you know, six, seven, fifty times. And also the, uh, they covered the invention of the optic, multi-layer optical printer that Richard Edlin uh, came up with to uh, do all of that compositing of all those different layers had to be uh, physically compositive and re-photographed off of the film negative. So they, they discussed that quite a bit. So they, they did pay a lot of attention to the technology and the evolution of the technology and then how that technology morphed into the computer and how it made all of that genius and created uh, physical cameras and optical printers obsolete across that paradigm shift to computer graphic. I personally think there should be a whole documentary about the Rebel Mac unit as someone who was in the Rebel Mac unit. <laughs> so, so I was, so, so I have, I have, I still have the jacket. So, um, yeah, so the, uh, so as someone who was in it, I, I think that they should do it. They didn't talk about it at all though, during, during the thing. They didn't talk about, the, again, I'm hoping this is the first season and they talk about other things that were there and other things that were talked through. Um, I think that there's plenty to talk about, uh, around how previs was revolutionized, how, um, you know, again, the Rebel, the Rebel Mac unit changed the way we did visual effects because, before that, it was all big SGI machines, and we were the some of the first people to do high-level visual effects um, that were uh, we did high-level visual effects that were done on a off-the-shelf hardware and software. See, um, see, there's so much left, and I think next Wednesday would be great, Alex. You got momentum now. You've got interest. Interest is half the battle, right? There'll be a bunch of people like, "Why are we doing this again?" We'll wait until oh. another. Well, once a month, we're gonna we're gonna break something down and. Take a look at it and learn from it, but we won't do it any faster. We'll, we'll find crowd, something it's new. There's e easy lift. There's a lot of fish in the sea. Okay. Sky. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much to the producers for all the great questions. Uh, hopefully, we got through most of them there. I think we got through all of them, and uh, really, really well done. Good, thoughtful discussion, both first hour, second hour. Uh, thanks to the panelists. Can't do this without you. And thanks to the incredible crew. There's a huge crew here that come that shows up every day, um, you know, and puts this thing, this this crazy thing together. It, it doesn't work this way because you know we're turning Zoom on and going. <laughs> you know, like there's a uh, an incredible set of set of people that make this all work in the background. You'll see the credits here in just a second. So um, so thanks to everyone out there doing the great work. And now uh, we're going to jump into after hours. I just want to go out and start doing visual effects shots. Some green screen.
I accidentally left my green screen near the window. Now it's kind of like light green. <laughs> Only parts of it, though. I'm still looking at the uh, group shots to see if I see Alex and the uh, thousands of people that worked at ILM. I don't know if I, I don't see the shot. Why is Mitchell so loud? I know, he yells. Oh, Alex yells the picture. He's yelling. Special effect. Oh my gosh, he's, why does he keep yelling into our, into our mic? He's been a good money on the mic. Eventually, I need to get a whisper mic. I understand. 